Michelle, are we ready to go live? Good evening. I'd like to welcome you all to the Planning and Zoning Public Hearing for Tuesday, October 26th, 2021. Our first thing is Pledge of Allegiance. If everyone could rise, take your hat off, and follow me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. Okay. I do just want to start off the evening uh, with a moment to acknowledge our planning and zoning family. In the past few weeks, some of our family have lost family members. To those of our family, please know we think of you and your loved ones often and please accept our heartfelt condolences. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I would also like to acknowledge Commissioner Bill Flagg for his many years of service. This is Bill's last meeting with us. And I just wanna extend our thanks for your dedicated service, Bill. Thank you very much. Can I say something? Yes, Commissioner Dexter. I would like to say a couple of things about Bill. Take two minutes. And I think I speak for all of us when I say that Bill Flagg exemplifies what it means to be a great member of this commission. Bill has served for 10 years. He's always come to every meeting prepared by visiting the site, reading the materials, yes, even the traffic studies, and preparing great questions for the applicant. Bill's focus has always been on the senior population in town, their safety through the insistence of sidewalks wide enough for wheelchairs, the number of handicapped parking spaces, ADA access into the buildings, elevators where possible, you name it. He always speaks his mind and he's true to himself. On a personal note, I'm going to miss Bill. We've been next to each other for but good part of those 10 years, he's always got a positive attitude, a smile, he's interested in you as a person outside of this commission. We've shared many a note and a glance and a laugh. Be well, Billy Flagg, stay in touch. Okay, uh, tonight um, our uh, our order of business will be, first, we're gonna hear an update from the applicant. Then we're gonna hear uh, comments from town staff. Then we will uh, also hear from interveners and address the intervener petitions. And then we'll hear from members of the public. Uh, due to the large crowd and wanting to get everybody the opportunity to speak if they wish, we're gonna have a three minute time limit on speakers. Now, once your three minutes is up and the vice chair will be keeping track of that, you will have the opportunity to continue speaking afterwards after everybody else has had a chance, if you so choose, and uh, under the same um, rules. Uh, I'll also ask that when people come up, if there's items that have already been mentioned, feel free to acknowledge that you feel the same way as uh, someone else with a particular topic. But I ask that you do not rehash the whole topic over again. Um, if the hearing is continued to our next meeting, then I would ask that anybody who speaks tonight and wants to speak at the next meeting please address new topics only or uh, on new information received. 
and uh, we will be keeping the public hearing open uh, to receive the input from the uh, Inland Wetlands Commission, uh, which uh, I believe will probably happen November 3rd. So um, at this time, um, and I will address the intervener petitions uh, when we get to that spot in the agenda. So uh, at this time, I'll ask the applicant if, oh, uh, I'm gonna turn to our secretary and let him read the public notice. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. To be published in the General Choir Thursday, October 21st, 2021, South Windsor Planning and Zoning Commission. Notice is hereby given that there will be a public hearing on Tuesday, October 26, 2021 at 7 p.m. in the council chambers of the South Windsor Town Hall to consider the following. One, application 21-36P, 25 Talbot Lane site plan. Request by UW Vintage Lane 2 LLC for site plan approval for a 359,640 square foot distribution facility on 30.37 acres of property on property located at 525 Talbot Lane, 475 and 551 Governor's Highway, I zone. This has been continued from 10, 12, 21. To view this meeting, please tune into channel 16 if your provider is Cox or go to gmedia.swagit.com slash live. Copies of, copies of this application are on file in the office of the town clerk in the planning department and online at www.southwindsor-ct.gov slash planning department slash pages slash planning and zoning commission applications. At this hearing, interested persons may be heard and written comments by the public will be received by mail or email. Persons who may require an accommodation can contact staff Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. at 860-644 2511 extension 329 Bart Passacone chairman planning and zoning commission thank you very much uh, can I just say that uh, to the public and everyone else I'm currently working uh, 12 hours a day at Millstone nuclear power plant so um, I get up at 345 in the morning for an outage 30 straight days so I'm gonna be leaving a little early I just want the public to think I'm just not getting up and leaving but I will watch the uh, rest of the night okay thank, thank you thank you and at this time, uh, we'll turn to the applicant. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman Pasconis, Vice Chairman Foley, and other members of the commission. And I'd like to make one more statement. If uh, anybody has a cell phone, if they could please put it to vibrate, we would appreciate it. Thank you, sorry about that. And I too would like to thank all the commissioners who have served or are presently serving, will serve in the future and served in the past. Uh, it's, uh, it's, I think it's, I know everybody thinks it's an honor to be able to serve and we very much appreciate your volunteerism uh, on behalf of the town of South Windsor. Uh, Bill? Uh, so I'm Peter DeMalley, president of Design Professionals on behalf of the applicant, which is UW Vintage Lane 2 LLC. Uh, requesting site plan approval for a roughly 360,000 square foot industrial building and distribution center uh, in the industrial zone at 25 Talbot Lane. It's four consolidated lots all with their own addresses but we're calling it 25 Talbot Lane uh, on a 30.37 acre tract uh, and as I stated at the prior hearing my client has already acquired the property subject property for the intended industrial use which is permitted by right in the zoning regulations. Our consulting team for tonight's hearing includes George Fellner of Fellner Associates architecture right here in the second row. Uh, we also have Ben Wheeler to my right, who is Director of Operations for Design Professionals and a licensed landscape architect. He'll be covering the site's design, including engineering, landscape architecture, and exterior lighting systems. Uh, John Plant is here of Langan for traffic engineering, uh, and he will be available for Q&A as uh, appropriate. Uh, Emily Perko and Matt Glenn of GEI will both be making presentations with respect to wildlife and storm drainage, respectively. Uh, Dr. Donald Poland of Goman and York is here for Q&A as well. Uh, and Attorney Jim Connor of Updike Kelly and Spellacy in Hartford for legal direction. We expect him to make some remarks, especially toward the end. Uh, Daniel Jamison, our project manager, is unavailable, unexpectedly unavailable this evening. Uh, and uh, two weeks ago, uh, we were asked to do a shortened version of a presentation for such a large development. 
uh, and brevity was a word, and we were held to about an hour plus Q&A, and we did hold to about an hour. Uh, as more of our entire design team is present tonight, uh, without the same time constraints, we'll expand our presentation, uh, reporting new information, and addressing some of the commissioner's comments. However, we do want to hear additional comments tonight from commissioners and interveners before fully responding at the next hearing. We did to understand from the chairman that it will be continued to a time after the wetlands decision expected on November 3rd, Wednesday, November 3rd. They conclude their hearing uh, last Wednesday on the 20th. Uh, site location, I won't get into anything on that other than southeast corner of Governor's Highway and Talbot Lane. We reviewed that last time. Uh, area land uses, I covered that rather fully at the initial hearing. Uh, industrial to the west, residential, and northwest of us to the northeast and east and south is uh, residential, single family residential, and of course the east of us, northeast of us is Temple of Beth Hillel, House of Worship. Uh, with respect to the plan of conservation development, just want to elaborate just a little bit on that. For many decades, the town has reserved this site for industrial development. Plan of conservation development, of course, is a guide adopted by this commission after consultation with all the boards and commissions of the town and input from the public. Uh, and it was implemented through zoning. Specifically, the plan of conservation development calls for minimizing the loss of industrial land for non-residential uses, and this iterated that of late during meetings and encourages business development in existing business zones such as this. It expressly shows this site for industrial development on your business development plan, which is part of the plan of conservation development. Again, the land use guide for the town uh, implemented through zoning and subdivision regulations. Uh, as to zoning, the town zoning map shows all four of our parcels in the industrial zone. We abut the 820 residential zones primarily to the northeast, east, and south. And as can be seen on the zoning map exhibit, if we have that, okay. Okay, thank you, Ben. Uh, and, uh, our tract is not only the, is not the only I zone parcel that butts residentially zoned land. There are hundreds of parcels in town that abut uh, industrial parcels. Uh, and we covered that on October 12th. Um, Ident Road, for example. Uh, our clients and the design team have gone to great measure to reduce impacts beyond the minimum zoning thresholds. Take a look at our exhibit, which depicts the largest building allowed on this site. It's not one we're, we're implementing. Do you need that again? Bear with us for a moment here while we switch exhibits. Thank you. So the large box that you see there yeah, outlined in red there, uh, is the largest bat building that would be allowed if we were to go to the maximum 50% lot coverage allowed under the industrial zone. That's roughly half the site, which is a 15-acre footprint building, uh, which, of course, we are not doing and we're not proposing. Uh, the regulations allow a building on our site to be as close as 60 feet from the residential zone. That's along Edgewood Drive, along Cody Circle, adjacent to Temple Beth Hillel, and uh, along the uh, northeast corner, uh, although there's no buffer uh, required along uh, a street. Uh, and of course, we are hundreds of feet from the Edgewood Drive and Cody Circle neighborhoods. Our proposed building has an eight and a quarter acre footprint. You can see that, Ben is outlining right here. This is our actual building that we're proposing. Considerably smaller, just over half the size of what's allowed in the zone uh, for lot coverage for a building at 50%. Uh, I'm going to quickly visit our initial submission in July. I did, went through that uh, in greater detail last week, last uh, two weeks ago, but I'll, I'll just summarize for tonight. I know not all commissioners were here, uh, but it appreciably reduces any impacts on the abutting neighborhood. Uh, the first plan, uh, if we could go to the color exhibit for that. Yeah, the old plan. And just quick summary on that, we had a 360,000 square foot building, 40 feet in height for regulations, with 12,000 square feet of office space evenly divided between the southeast corner and the southwest corner. Uh, the truck areas were concentrated away from the majority of residences, residences in the northerly half of the property, it's opposite Edgewood Drive uh, along Governor's Highway, with 27 loading docks on each side, that's 54 total, uh, that's on the east and west sides and 118 trailer spaces, 74 in the northwest corner and 44 in the northeast corner. 
and we had 269 employee parking spaces on the south end of the property, uh, split between both sides of the building, and we had 64 in reserve up in the trailer parking areas if needed. All trucks were to access the site to and from Route 5 by a Talbot Lane off our northwest corner, uh, away from the neighborhood. All cars were also to access via Talbot Lane. Uh, they'd go to the right as they entered the site and the trucks would go to the left. Emergency vehicle access driveway was going to go out to Governor's Highway and we we're at 27.2% building coverage. Again, you're allowed 50% uh, and 57.5% impervious coverage. We had no outdoor industrial yard, which is allowed in the industrial zone. Uh, building property line setbacks were just shy of 100 feet to Governor's Highway, 340 feet to Talbot Lane uh, to the west. That'd be 215 feet to Edgewood Drive and 425 feet to Cody Circle area. And that's to the property line, from building to the property line. Uh, distances from the loading docks to homes with this plan, 770 feet to Edgewood Drive uh, to the closest home in Edgewood Drive, 530 to Cody Circle, 260 to Governor's Highway and our buffering far exceeded the 50-foot minimum. Uh, we had uh, not only 50 feet along the southerly side, maintain the existing mature forest on the southerly side and easterly side, but inside that, we're, we're also going to have a planted evergreen trees on top of a six-foot earthen berm. So we have, instead of a 50-foot required buffer area, we're going to observe 90 feet along the south and east sides of the property. Uh, and between that and the building, we're having a roughly two acre water quality basin was proposed, uh, again, between the buffers and the building. Now let's switch over, if we can, to the current plan, which we only presented in an illustrative form, uh, conceptually, because we had not engineered it. But we're in response to Michelle Light, Director of Planning's uh, October 5th uh, request or recommendation which read, after further review of the proposed site plan, the amount of public interest and location of this facility as it relates to its proximity to the residential area, it is recommended that all the loading docks be placed on the westerly side of the building rather than the uh, northeast and northwest sides. Uh, I would not recommend seeking a waiver of section 6484, which is what she indicated to us. Uh, and we indicated last uh, two weeks ago, while such change would take away from some of the building's competitive position in the marketplace, Docks on both sides of the building or gives us a competitive advantage over many sites uh, and cost our clients some serious money. Our clients agreed to this change and authorized this commenced design. We have engineered that design and submitted the revised plans to the Inland Wetlands Agency as well as to this board. Um, and as I mentioned before, the Wetlands Agency closed their hearing last Wednesday the 20th and we expect a decision on November 3rd. Uh, this second plan is the same building size as the first one. Uh, parking now at 333 spaces on the east side and no need for reserve spaces, other eight handicapped spaces. Uh, it meets the zoning requirement for parking uh, without a waiver. This may get reduced once we land a tenant. If so, we would return to you uh, if, if for a waiver if so needed, but right now we're just meeting the zoning requirement. Of necessity for safety and security, we need to separate the employee parking area that's on the east side from the truck operations. Uh, so that it's designed accordingly. Uh, office is now at the northeast corner of the building, as uh, Mr. Fellner will indicate to you uh, in his presentation. There are 34 EV charging stations, 10 activated, initially 24 in reserve, and we'll have 54 loading docks all along the west side of the building, uh, as requested. There's a slight reduction in trailer space at 111. Again, all moved to the west side of the building, and all trucks enter from Talbot, but turn left and right to go north and south. Uh, we have the same 90-foot buffers, as I explained for the first one. Uh, we've reconfigured the water quality basin, but still around two acres, uh, and it has a fountain for aeration. The building to the property line setbacks, same as the first one for, on the north side to Governor's Highway. Uh, 207 feet to, to Carla's Pasta area, uh, 460 feet from Talbot Lane, 214 feet on the south side to the closest property line, uh, that'd be Edgewood Drive neighborhood, 385 feet to the east, which is the Cody Circle neighborhood. So again, that's building to property line. Uh, and building to residences, uh, we are at 320 feet to the closest Edgewood Drive residence, 240 feet to the closest Governor's Highway residence, 473 feet 
to the closest Cody Circle residents. Loading dock distances to homes that was of interest last time, uh, 360 feet roughly to Edgewood, uh, 580 feet to Governor's Highway, and over 900 feet to Cody Circle, that's through the building. Uh, we're limiting the number of curb cuts on our extensive frontage. Our drainage does not go to Stoutenbrook as some have stated at prior hearings. A uh, reminder that we are in the I zone and not in the higher I-291 CD zone as we've done some recent buildings such as Coca-Cola. Uh, with respect to sound, uh, just, a, just a quick little note, both the state and local noise statutes or sound statutes or ordinances do not apply to tractor trailers uh, and tractor trailers do not have backup alarms. Uh, noise, from the loading, noise from the loading and unloading is internal to the trailer and Please. building. Okay, continue. So noise from the loading and unloading is internal to the trailer and the building and we are 360 feet to the closest home on Edgewood and it is around the corner. Our loading docks are close to the open space of the northwest corner of Edgewood Drive uh, adjacent to Carlos Pasta. Uh, as to ADA, we will be compliant in all respects uh, for in the truck area, also for the other parts, and we can elaborate if you'd like. Uh, as to the process, a decision will be made on whether to build a spec building uh, before we land a tenant uh, or uh, we await the tenant to build uh, once we have secured our approvals. So we're not making a decision on that until we've secured all of our approvals. Uh, as to truck idling, we will be compliant. There's a statute on that, and we'll post signs to that effect. Uh, we are prepared, once we have additional comments, as I mentioned earlier, once we have additional comments from the commissioners, some of whom weren't here last time, uh, and also here from the interveners and the public um, and staff, uh, we will, um, we'd like to address some of these other comments that were uh, in, in, in queries by commissioners that were raised last time. Uh, just a reminder, Economic Development Commission did endorse this plan uh, and that uh, based on comments from this commission, including in your plan of conservation development at recent meetings, uh, change from, of this land from industrial to residential is not in the cards um, and uh, the market is not there for an industrial subdivision with a smaller, uh, smaller buildings and smaller lots. Uh, and I think uh, that's what we're going to do. Uh, Benjamin Wheeler has some comments, uh, and he's up next. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Peter, for the record. Ben Wheeler, uh, Director of Operations and Landscape Architecture with Design Professionals located here in South Windsor. Uh, I am a licensed landscape architect in the state of Connecticut. Um, as Mr. DeMalley mentioned, um, uh, Mr. Jameson, Daniel Jameson, licensed professional engineer in the state of Connecticut, uh, had intended to uh, attend tonight and uh, present uh, some of the storm drainage information in more detail than we presented last time, um, but he did have something come up at the last minute, and so um, I will be presenting some of that information on his behalf. Um, the plans were, as we mentioned last time, uh, prepared by our office under the direction of, of Mr. Jameson. Um, following uh, standard engineering practices. So I gave a brief presentation last time about the storm drainage philosophy uh, as we were working on the, uh, diligently on the plan changes to accommodate switching the loading docks from the east side to the west side of the building. The same drainage philosophy as with the original site design remains in this one in that on the east side of the site where the auto parking is now uh, the southern portion of that will sheet flow into the water quality basin. The northern portion of that will uh, enter into a series of catch basins of pipes, which then discharge into the water quality basin. The west side of the site, where it is now all uh, associated with truck activity, uh, same again, same philosophy as the previous plans, where it will enter a series of catch basins uh, and pipes and run through a series of underground infiltrator units which provide uh, water quality treatment um, and also convey the stormwater uh, to end up discharging into the same water quality basin. As we had stated previously, um, and as is indicated in the updated stormwater management report, which was submitted uh, and dated uh, revised to October 15th, 2021, the projected peak flows leaving the site will be 
below or essentially the same as the pre-developed conditions that exist today. And uh, Mr. Jamison and his team analyzed that uh, for the 2, 10, 25, 50, and 100 year storms uh, as a standard practice. Uh, using data from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Precipitation Frequency uh, Data Server, um, which helps take into account or does take into account uh, recent rain events and makes a prediction, um, an updated prediction on the uh, amount of rain for each of those storm events. Also, as mentioned previously, the uh, stormwater design was completed following the 2002, uh, uh, to, excuse me, the 2004 Connecticut Stormwater Quality Manual. Um, and in fact, the design, the updated design, as well as the previous design, far exceed uh, what is recommended in that manual. And for instance, the Water Quality Manual uh, suggests basing its calculations on the uh, first inch of rainfall, uh, commonly referred to as the first flush. Um, and with our calculations, um, in consultation with the town engineer, all of our calculations were based on a two-year storm, uh, which is 3.1 inches based on the latest data from NOAA. Um, so basically, the water quality treatment systems, both on the west and the east side of the site, are three times uh, what is recommended in the stormwater quality manual. A very large majority of the site runoff will be captured and routed through the water quality treatment systems, the, uh, the water quality basin and the uh, underground infiltrator uh, units, um, and then discharge into the uh, existing stilling basin, which exists at the southwest corner of the site, uh, which is uh, basically right in this area. The, um, the areas to the east and the south of the berms will continue to drain as they do today, um, basically because you, know, the, you have the top of the berm and that water will continue to, to run off to the south and to the east. And um, there is one, uh, one roof leader, and as we went through the process with the Wetlands Commission, there is one roof leader on the east side of the building which will be routed around the water quality basin and discharged into the drainage ditch uh, that runs off towards uh, Cody Circle. And just as a reminder, I know all of you know, but uh, roof runoff uh, such as that is considered clean runoff and does not uh, require um, further treatment per standard engineering practices. The large majority of the area between the berm along Governor's Highway and Governor's Highway itself will be uh, routed into a series of swales and yard drains uh, which then goes into the same storage drainage system either on the east or west side of the site through the same water quality treatment practices uh, on either side of the building um, and then discharged into the same stilling basin at the southwest corner of the site. So again, just to reiterate, almost the entire site uh, under the designed plans will be captured, routed through our water treatment systems um, and then discharged into that stilling basin at the southwest corner of the site. That stilling basin uh, was installed uh, with the Carla's Pasta expansion um, approximately four to five years ago, uh, and that was negotiated between the then owners of Carla's Pasta um, and the then owners of this property to solely accommodate runoff drainage from this site. Um, and again, that, that was something that was negotiated and for the sole purpose of accepting drainage from this site. And I'll go into a little bit more details because there were questions last time about where does the stormwater go uh, once it leaves this site. Um, so the, the water leaves the stilling basin, uh, and again, a, a large majority of our site will drain through that stilling basin. I'm going to pull up another exhibit here that shows a little more of the area. Very large file, so it'll take a second to, to load up here. So just for reference, here's the, the subject site. Here's Carlos Pasta. You can see the first phase of the expansion, which is completed and built today. That stilling basin is this dark spot. Uh, that you can see right here. So the water from the site enters that stilling basin, as I mentioned, and then leaves the stilling basin through a 36-inch pipe. 
And again, that 36 inch pipe is dedicated solely to uh, accepting the runoff from the site. Um, it does not have any pipes from the Carlos Pasta development discharging into it. So it's basically all of our site and then whatever uh, sheet flow runoff might enter the stilling basin, uh, which does not have a large drainage area draining to it. Based on the installed slopes of the 36 inch pipe, um, Mr. Daniel uh, Jameson ran some calculations. Uh, that 36 inch pipe has a carrying capacity of approximately 43.7 cubic feet per second. Um, and based on our stormwater calculations as indicated in the, the stormwater report, for the 100 year storm, the flows leaving our site are 21.33 CFS for the 100 year storm. So again, 21.33 CFS for the 100 year storm. That is less than half the carrying capacity for that 36 inch pipe based on its installed slopes. As we have stated previously, um, at, both as a part of this hearing and as a part of other presentations, typically uh, underground stormwater pipes are designed to accommodate a 10 year storm as a standard engineering practice. And again, that, that pipe, 36 inch pipe accommodates twice the runoff from our site of a 100 year storm. So it is a well in excess of what is designed per standard engineering practices. So just to continue on uh, as to where the water continues to go. So that, that stilling basin is here again, that 36 inch pipe then makes a 90 degree turn and heads to the south and then discharges approximately at this point here. Uh, where there was a uh, there was an existing drainage ditch when Carlos Pasta expansion was built that ran east to west, that was extended further to the north to this point, um, again solely to accept that discharge from that 36 inch pipe. So this is an open channel drainage ditch that was installed with the Constitution Landing Industrial Subdivision, which is essentially this whole industrial area around Nutmeg Road South. And then that, that drainage ditch travels to the west uh, under this uh, driveway here uh, for this building on Nutmeg Road South, uh, a couple of large uh, pipes that go underneath that driveway and then discharges into this area here, which is a detention basin that was built for, again, the Constitution Landing Industrial Subdivision. From there, it travels underneath Nutmeg Road South and then in this area here is a, another detention basin, uh, which is uh, op, on property owned by the town of South Windsor. From there, it discharges to the west underneath Route 5 and into Newberry Brook, which then leads to the Connecticut River. So that gives you uh, an idea of where the water will travel if this site uh, does get built as proposed. Uh, basically, uh, again, uh, a very large majority of the site will run off to the south and west through the industrial subdivision, um, through the two detention basins for Constitution Landing, and then discharge into Newberry Brook. So with that, uh, that gives you uh, an update on our stormwater management report uh, based on the revised design uh, and, and gives you a better idea of where the storm, majority of the stormwater does flow uh, from our site. Um, again, a portion of it uh, will drain off um, as it does today based on the berm, and then the one roof leader will, will drain off to the east uh, into an existing drainage channel and then the drainage system uh, for the Cody Circle uh, building the state subdivision. Um, and with that, uh, I'll be available for any questions that you may have. We're now going to turn it over to Matt Glent, a professional engineer with GEI, who did an analysis uh, with respect to storm drainage and impact on abutting properties. Again, uh, Matt Glunt with GEI Consultants. I'm a professional engineer. Uh, I've been in the industry about 18 years. Um, 
Um, a geotechnical engineer by trade, um, and in, in conjunction with that, I, I do groundwater studies, um, and there are also some folks in our office that, that do the same. Um, so we were brought on by the project team uh, to look at uh, potential impacts to uh, abutting properties uh, caused by uh, inflows into that, uh, the big detention basin on the southeast corner, uh, as Ben has, has mentioned. Um, a lot of the flow from the site will enter that basin. Um, so our, the purpose of our uh, study uh, was to look at uh, if there was a, uh, a peak inflow into that basin uh, equivalent to the 100-year storm, uh, would that have impacts on uh, the overall groundwater, uh, both within our property and on abutting properties next door. Um, so the, the results of our study are, are shown on the right. Um, what it shows is that uh, basically with a, with a peak inflow with an elevation of, of 74, um, that it would cause a, uh, what we would call a mound or a, a slight rise uh, to the closest residence, which is at 95 Cody Circle of about uh, 0.2 feet. Uh, a couple things to point out. Uh, this model was with the, uh, the previous version of the site plan before it was re-engineered in early October. Um, I understand that, that uh, with the larger basin, that peak flow was actually six inches lower. Um, so that peak elevation with the 100 year storm is now 73.5 instead of 74. So that 0.2 feet is actually going to be lower. Uh, we have not re-engineered that. Uh, as Peter mentioned, the, the entire site has not been re-engineered according to that new site plan. But I would just like to point out that, that, that so that 0.2 feet can be considered a, a conservative estimate. Um, and again, that's the 100 year flood. Um, and that only looks at effects from the basin itself. Uh, does not take into account other effects that are happening, um, such as flooded roads, flooded catch basins, everything else that may be going on under that storm scenario. This is uh, broken out as one particular impact uh, that may occur as part of um, the, the peak flow that go into that basin. Um, and just for some, some context as far as how the overall, uh, Ben went into some detail about uh, how the, the surface stormwater works um, in terms of the, the groundwater and how we, um, how we believe this is going to affect it. Um, from what we've seen from data on the site, uh, we believe a, a normal groundwater elevation is about elevation 71. Um, so, uh, what we believe is going to happen, this, this basin is actually going to um, have an effect of controlling groundwater uh, because it takes, you know, once it gets to a, a certain elevation in that basin, um, there will be an outflow to the west through the, the structures that Ben mentioned. Um, as to, you know, comparison to pre-development where there are no controls on the property for uh, sudden storms, peak flows, whereas this basin will have an effect of controlling that level um, in particular on this area of the site. Um, so I'll be available for, for Q&A if there are any questions on this. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And incidentally, his report was submitted to the commission with our other documents. Uh, we're going to, uh, Don Poland is uh, not going to testify right now. He's available for Q&A for municipal and fiscal impact analysis. Uh, I summarized that last time. Suffice it to say, just real property taxes alone, or going from $16,000 a year up to over $700,000 a year. There are other um, benefits to the community uh, that were derived from that report. So he's available for any Q&A if you have any. But the full report of his was submitted to the commission. And John Plant from Langan is also here, the traffic engineer. His full report was submitted. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you have some questions for him later. But um, uh, he's available as well. Uh, came from his office. And also, uh, next, we'd like to introduce George Fellner. Uh, with Fellner uh, Architects, and he uh, went to the Architectural Design Review Committee. You going to bring that up? Just uh, last Thursday, I believe, they um, made a presentation at the Architectural Design Review Committee of this commission. So good evening, I'm George Fellner from Fellner Architects, a licensed architect in the state of Connecticut. 
And what I'm going to do is first describe the floor plan. George, if you could please talk into the microphone. The You're change that was made soft. from last week, um, from the two weeks ago, is the um, change of the loading docks. You can see all of them on the west side of the plan, as described uh, earlier this evening. So the building is 810 feet by 444 feet, uh, just under 360,000 square feet. And the, uh, I want to mention that this design does meet the uh, code requirements in terms of accessible doors, travel distances, and so on. And so uh, loading and service areas do not require accessible entry as it applies to this layout. And that's taken from the section 1105.1.2 of the International Building Code. So we are well in compliance in terms of accessibility for this building. Next. Um, yes, so I'd like to go to the elevations. It'd be best if we can go to the colored versions. It'd be easier to see. Sure. So you can see the elevations uh, as they have changed from the last meeting. The, um, the second row, which is the west elevation, shows the 54 loading docks on that west side, going from left to right. The, um, the upper plan is the, uh, that's the north elevation. And then if we go to the, the third one is the south elevation. And then the final one is the east elevation, which has the offices on the far right side, which is the northeast corner. I want to mention, uh, just to uh, reiterate the design in terms of the composition, the 10-foot high band of, uh, is the split-face concrete block, which serves as a textured base. And that is 10 feet high, and it is punctuated by the, the various doors, windows, as well as the overhead doors on the west side. The upper 28-foot wide band consists of the fluted metal panel wall system, which is a cool desert beige color. It has um, also gutters at the uh, horizontal top trim with leaders, which helps break up the vertical uh, wall areas. There are linear clear story windows. You can see a series of them going across from left to right, which break up the large areas, as well as providing natural lighting for the interior of the building. In addition, the, the dark brown areas, uh, that is the um, upper flat metal panel wall system. So that's flat and not fluted like, like the remaining uh, beige color. That is um, articulating the office area. It, comes, it basically cascades down and then bends to form the sloped canopy system at the entry. You can see it on the side elevation there. So um, the goal here is to have a harmonious blend of masses, elements, tux textures, and colors with a palette of complementary earth tones. If we could skip to the renderings. We've updated the renderings to reflect the change. Uh, this is the uh, view, view from, the, from the intersection of Governor's Highway and Talbot Lane. It's taken from halfway up the berm between the balsam fir and white fir trees, and it's looking towards the west elevation where you can see the, the full extent of the loading docks from, from one side to the other. If we can go to the, the other rendering, this is the view towards the northeast corner, which focuses on the office entry. So there you can see the, um, the dark brown flat panel system, and, then how, and you, can just, you can see the uh, canopy in that dark triangular area that comes out. Okay. If we can go to the, the detail sheet. Okay, so this, this uh, basically shows the uh, exterior elements as the insulated metal panel wall system, which has a three-inch foam core insulation. Uh, this is a Butler product. It, the fluted uh, system consists of the cool desert beige, which you see there, 
and also in the rendering, and then the flat uh, cool harvest is the dark, darker brown. The, below that is the split face concrete block, which is tan gray. And again, the use of these complementary earth tones enhances the visual effect for the theme and variations in terms of surface treatment, texture, and colors. The, um, the other thing I want to mention is the lighting. If you look at the detail, you can see the, um, the egress doors have a D-series LED wall luminaire system by Lithonia Lighting. These are down lights with a color temperature of 4,000 degrees Kelvin. And at the office area, uh, we have soffit down lights, recessed down lights, which are um, by USAI lighting uh, with 3,000 degrees Kelvin uh, temperature. So uh, with that, the, um, the intent of our design is to be harmonious, compatible with the surrounding context of buildings. Um, do we want to look at the rendering? The, the, um, we have some images of the surrounding buildings. I don't know if you included sure. it. Okay, well, I showed it to you at the last, at the first meeting. So it basically, it was, a, it was a series of photographs of the Temple of Beth Hillel, commercial storefront services, Harris Rebar, Carla's Pasta, and so on. And um, basically, those buildings display horizontal banding of masonry and metal panels. So we feel that what we've designed is, is uh, would be a good neighbor to those um, types of design uh, elements. And that uh, is pretty much my presentation for tonight. For the record, Ben Wheeler again, just to add to what George said and, and Mr. DeMalley did mention, we, we did uh, have a second visit with the Architectural Design Review Committee last Thursday. I'm sure uh, Michelle Leip will, will report on that as well, but uh, in general, we feel like they were uh, uh, very pleased with the, the update to the building, um, especially with the loading docks moved to the west side of the building. Next up, and I think our final presenter right now during our formal presentation, I think Mr. Connor will be later. Uh, we will uh, like to invite up Emily Perko. She's a consultant with GEI out of Glastonbury, uh, and she's going to report on not only her efforts uh, with respect to wildlife uh, and the flora and fauna, but also the exhaustive efforts on the part of many different consultants in their organization on behalf of this project over a very long period of time. Emily? Good evening, Commission. Uh, just for the record, my name is Emily Perko. I'm an ecologist and certified soil scientist with GEI Consultants here on behalf of the applicant. Uh, I just want to just give a brief presentation about the uh, habitat assessment that I performed on the site on September 27th. Um, so the focus of this actual investigation wasn't on the site as a whole. It was really more on the two delineated water courses, uh, which if you are able to turn your heads, uh, I'm just kind of highlighting them right in here. Um, I did obviously walk the entire site, um, but again, my main focus was on the habitat that was um, presumed to be within those water courses. Um, it was noted through extensive report writing prior to my arrival that uh, the water courses contain very sparse to no vegetation within them, which I then confirmed in the site investigation. The topography between the northwestern wetland, which is right in here, and this first water course uh, was relatively flat and apparently a disturbed landscape with a uh, created kind of hummocks in the landscape. It's uh, not terribly enjoyable to walk through. Um, but once I was kind of a bit south, there was an abrupt three to four foot drop leading down into these water courses. I walked the length of each one and looked for signs of drainage features or natural drainage patterns that would indicate superficial water flow. It did not observe any such features. There was no water observed in either water course with the exception of a few inches of standing water in or apart in an approximately four square foot area in the western side of the southern water course, so the longer one right in here. Um, I advanced a soil pit within each water course and encountered groundwater within six inches of the surface, indicating a very high Testimony and affidavits have documented and raised concerns regarding negative impacts to wildlife. Um, my report specifically addresses painted turtles, snapping turtles, and green tree frogs, which were identified by affidavits as being in the vicinity or within these water courses. 
Painted turtles are primarily aquatic species, feeding on aquatic vegetation, inhabiting shallow pools, rivers, wet meadows, and bogs. They hibernate in ponds and only feed underwater. They rely on aquatic vegetation for protection from predators. These water courses do not fulfill any of these requirements. The common snapping turtle is highly adaptive and will inhabit almost any body of water. They will eat a wide range of small vertebrate species and various plants. Although it has been documented they can inhabit semi-permanent bodies of water, these water courses are considered to be an ephemeral and do not hold water long enough even for the common snapping turtle to inhabit. The lack of vegetation within these water courses also make it sparse for foraging. Green tree frogs are not an aquatic species once they reach maturity. However, they breed in swamps, pools, and semi-permanent ponds, and tadpoles will live in water until fully developed. The ephemeral nature of these water courses do not provide the necessary criteria to support the documented species. The proposed stormwater quality basin along the eastern and southern portion of the property has the potential to serve as an aquatic habitat. An off-site basin adjacent to the site was observed to have aquatic life present, specifically green frogs, along with hydrophytic vegetation. If properly managed, the proposed basin will have the potential to support similar aquatic life and serve as an adequate habitat for species noted above. Concerns, concerns have been raised about habitat pathways being taken away as a result of this proposed development. The proposed site plan includes a landscaped berm, as sh shown right in here, uh, a 50-foot vegetated buffer along the southern and eastern property boundaries. Uh, this area, in addition to the 50-foot a uh, planted buffer that was a condition of the Cody Circle subdivision in adjacent town-owned open space parcels will provide an adequate pathway for local or migratory species to travel through. Between the basin, the berm, and the vegetated buffers, on the eastern end we're looking at approximately 190 feet of area, and then on the southern side approximately 140 feet of suitable area for safe passage for various species, whether local or migratory. Um, lastly, I would like to touch upon uh, the various evaluations by multiple biologists and ecologists that have taken place on this property since 2019. Starting in 2019, uh, one of GEI's senior biologists, Karen Stockpole, evaluated the site for various habitats um, from the state-listed species of concern. We also contracted out William Moorhead, who at the time was a private consultant, but now actually works for the State of Connecticut Natural Diversity Database Division, to survey the property for rare plants. He was out there on six different occasions in 2019 evaluating the site. We also contracted out an entomologist and biologist, Chris Davis and Neil Kapitilik, uh, who surveyed the property for invertebrate species on th three separate occasions in 2019. After Mr. William Moorhead uh, left the consulting industry and started his job with the state of Connecticut. We brought on Lauren Green, who is a botanist and recognized by the state, to continue onward with rare plant surveys. So she was on the property July 7th of this year. Uh, further, we had Jim McManus, who was a hired soil scientist to delineate the wetlands and watercourses on the property and also completed a functions and values assessment of the watercourses. He was performing his site activities uh, on three separate occasions this year. After the uh, Wetlands Commission received various testimony disputing his delineation, the town hired a third party reviewer, George Logan, who is a professional wetland scientist, senior professional ecologist, and registered soil scientist. He performed three separate evaluations on the site as well, all within this year, and I myself visited the site, as I had stated previously, on September 27, 2001. We've also received the necessary approvals from the Natural Diversity Database with the Connecticut Department of Environmental Energy Protection Wildlife Division, as well as the United States Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, that is all I have for this evening. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Emily. Just for clarification on our current engineered site plan that we submitted to you between this hearing and the last hearing, um, on the east side of the property is the entire uh, employee parking and visitor parking area. The area that they're egressing from, ingressing and egressing from on the northeast corner of our property onto Governor's Highway, that was originally going to be just emergency vehicle access point. 
but because we flipped all uh, truck activities operations, loading docks, trailer parking, what have you, um, activities uh, to the west side, we need access for the uh, parking on the east side for the employees, uh, and that, uh, hence we have to do that. Um, so that changed from a, a emergency vehicle access point only, and for, of course, maintenance vehicles, uh, plowing and the like. Uh, now, in the winter, during winter storm events, it's now serving the entire uh, parking area, parking field for the employees and visitors. Uh, another thing is uh, the the access drive or the drives on the north side and south side of the buildings, uh, which are really for um, emergency vehicles and for maintenance uh, and for security. Um, those will have uh, gates so that the trucks cannot go to and from the uh, truck areas uh, through the parking area and the other part of the site and go out to Governor's Highway uh, and ingress or egress through that uh, uh, northeast uh, entrance drive. So that is uh, another thing I want to bring your attention. And, and what I really like about the latest plan is we are able to achieve Mr. Fellner working with our staff um, at grade entrance for the parking uh, at the northeast corner for all employees and visitors. Uh, we have uh, we have one only one waiver request, and that is a waiver request for the height. Uh, ben Wheeler will address that in a moment. Just wanted to just summarize because I think that concludes our formal remarks tonight. I uh, just wanted to summarize that we believe we are consistent uh, with the zoning regulations in every respect, with the exception of just a waiver that's allowed by virtue of your regulations. Uh, this is a, a use distribution facility type use is allowed by right. Uh, we meet all the dimensional requirements and far exceed them uh, in terms of distances, separations, uh, coverages, and the like. Uh, we meet the parking requirements. Last time we were working for requesting a waiver so we could put some in reserve. We're no longer requesting that. Uh, and uh, we believe we've gone above and beyond with respect to storm drainage and also with respect to water quality and with respect to buffering uh, this facility from the uh, neighboring residential zones and uses. Uh, we have essentially doubled uh, the buffer. We went from 50 foot buffer along their property line, so that will not change. And then internal to that, we have another 40 foot buffer with a six foot berm planted with evergreen trees on both sides, three to one slopes. And then beyond that, we have the water quality basin, which is a pond, a two acre pond. And then we have our building. And, the, uh, and we have quite a distance separating us, our activities from any residences. Uh, and uh, we think we've gone way beyond what is allowable in the zone. And one additional reminder, and that is that uh, we're in the industrial zone, and this is what governs virtually all industrial development in this town, with the exception of the corridor development zone, which is, requires uh, to, uh, built, to be built to a higher standard than the industrial zone. But we think this is a good quality building, wonderful project. Uh, it's an excellent design site. Uh, and we very much look forward to your questions and comments and, and uh, comments from the public. Ben's just going to comment uh, with respect to the uh, waiver for lighting. As I stated uh, at the last hearing, we did submit a formal uh, request for a uh, height waiver for just the, the poles within the truck court area to allow those to go up to 35 feet um, as you know, the regulations allow 25 feet um, and a provision to uh, allow for that waiver um, when you certainly have uh, been consistent with granting that waiver for similar projects in, in recent years. So we're, we're not asking for anything that, uh, that hasn't been granted in the past. As stated last time, the original waiver for, was for 12 poles with the uh, reconfiguration uh, we added one additional pole to that uh, just because of the, the distribution of the light required one additional light pole. So the waiver request is now for, for 13 poles, again, all in the truck areas on the west side of the building, all of the poles on the north, east, and south sides of the building uh, will be at 25 feet as allowed in your regulations. So that concludes our formal remarks, and we do have uh, all of our design team members who are here tonight that we introduced to you at the beginning of the presentation are available for any Q&A you may have uh, later on in the program. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. At this time, we'll turn to our town staff.
our town planner, Michelle Light. Uh, thank you. Just as a real quick update, um, so we did re receive revised plans, a revised traffic study and drainage comps, a new lighting uh, waiver request, revised traffic, uh, I'm sorry, revised elevations. The applicant did return to design review last Thursday on the 21st to review the change in the building elevations as well as to review materials in the colors. Design review committee was pleased with the relocation of the loading docks to the westerly side of the building. Uh, this provides an opportunity for the office to be in the front of the building and address Governor's Highway. I think they were pleased with that as well. Uh, they did forward a favorable review of this project to the commission. A couple other things. Uh, I did hand out to the commission members a copy of the town's noise ordinance as well as uh, a couple of state exclusions and exemptions to the noise ordinance. So that is something you should have in front of you. Noise was a topic at our last meeting. Um, as indicated, the Wetlands Commission did hold their public hearing, the third night of public hearings. It was closed on October 20th. It is slated for November 3rd uh, for a decision. Uh, the, the Wetlands Commission does have 65 days from the close of a public hearing to make a decision. However, as indicated, it is on November 3rd agenda. Um, I did want to just bring you quickly updated. I did speak to both Lieutenant Bonaducci in the police department as well as our town manager related to the through truff, truck traffic um, prohibition in town. Um, the police department has difficulty with the enforcement of it due to some of the nuances of it and the way that the Office of State Traffic Administration requires uh, a tra traffic prohibition to be put in place. So I'm just going to read briefly uh, the town attorney who had given the town manager uh, a reading on this back in December of 2020, um, just briefly, and then I have handed it into the record, which is basically a copy out of the OSTA regulations as to when and how a town can put that kind of a, a prohibition into place. So uh, this is from Kerry Olson, our town attorney, to Michael Maniscalco, town manager. As of October 2011, the authority to create limited access roads was given to the Office of State Traffic Administration. Note that towns cannot control through truck traffic by local ordinance. Also, any truck with a destination within the town is deemed to not be a through truck. While a town can restrict truck use on wholly local roads that start and end within the town based upon weight class, uh, none of the roads referenced would seem to qualify, and if the ordinance basically results in a de facto prohibition on through trucks, it will be void. And so she goes on to give to the town manager the exact uh, language and the state statutes related to uh, establishing that, recommending that uh, if the town wants to pursue something like that, that we deal with the Office of State Traffic Administration. Um, again, I give this to the commission because in talking with the police department, this is some of the concern with actually stopping and ticketing trucks is because if they're going to deliver within town, they are not breaking any laws. So it's a very difficult uh, thing for them to know whether or not uh, a truck is in violation. So again, that's just for the commission's edification and um, put on the record. Uh, the last thing I just want to let you know is I did hand out to you since we do have some interveners. Uh, petitions that were filed. Uh, we do have a document that was created many years ago by a previous town attorney on how we review intervener petition statuses. Uh, we did review this with our current town attorney and this is still something that she recommends that the commission use as a tool to review an intervener petition and I also did give you a copy of the statute related to that. That concludes uh, my comments at this time. Thank you. Okay and those letters that uh, or that letter that you read in the noise ordinance will be attached to the minutes? Correct, it'll be part of the minutes, yes. Okay. Yep. Okay, at this time we'll turn to our town engineer, Jeff Doolittle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple of uh, updates on my comments uh, from the previous meeting. Um, so the, I noticed on this plan, the access driver on the north side of the, and south side of the building listed as having heavy duty pavement. Um, my question is why that is that not standard duty pavement? Why is heavy duty pavement called out there? Um, the EV parking spaces have been labeled. They need to be clearly labeled for level two chargers. Um, the existing drainage structure is at the east side of the property uh, near Baker Lane and Cody Circle. Uh, one has water going to it. The south one near Cody Circle they're actually discharging some water from the building towards that structure, I imagine, to keep uh, water in that system for the Wetlands Commission. Uh, the north one by Baker Lane is not, so I suggest the north one be abandoned and removed slash buried so it's not an attractive nuisance for somebody to get injured on. 
Um, still reviewing the stormwater drainage, but my review of the initial stormwater drainage showed that it would function well during uh, the design storms as specified. Um, just some notes that need to be clarified regarding the um, concrete barrier curb that's on the northeast side of the site uh, that was placed many, many years ago for an abandoned Newberry Road. Um, and the uh, application will need WPCA review and approval. That's all. That's it. That's it. Okay. Um, at this time, uh, we're going to address the intervener petitions. Uh, we have three intervener petitions. The first is on, uh, from Karen Vicklinitz and from Gerald Kayare, and I apologize if I butchered your names. Um, the second being from Derek Butler, and the third being from John Hapowitz. Um, I'm going to address the first one, um, and uh, the commission is accepting um, these intervener uh, petitions based on the verified uh, complaint with uh, limited to specific items under the planning and zoning jurisdiction. And I'll move down to those items, which start on number four of the petition. Um, 4A, uh, yes, that's covered by planning and zoning purview. Uh, B, uh, which says the application is incomplete. Um, that, and this, this is really uh, necessarily for planning and zoning purview, but um, if it fits the intent of the Connecticut General Statute, uh, I believe that was 22A and possibly 23, 22A.19. Um, so, uh, again, A is covered under that. And it uh, does uh, comply with the, uh, just give me a minute here. It, it is tied to the air, water, and natural resources um, language in the uh, Connecticut General Statute. B is not, as in the application is incomplete. Uh, C uh, deals with the application has not provided a wildlife inventory to evaluate impact on the wildlife on site and the surrounding habitat area. Uh, right now, uh, it would be um, on the intervener uh, to provide how that might impact uh, the wildlife, um, how this uh, development might impact the wildlife uh, on site. Um, and it would also possibly up, be up to the commission uh, to decide if we need a, a wildlife study for the property. Uh, on D, the applicant's traffic study is fatally flawed and invalid. Uh, traffic is not part of the envir environmental law, so uh, it's not pertinent to this. E, uh, the application uh, is within its, with its significant increase in intensity on the use of the property and that inadequate proposal for the management of stormwater runoff. Um, e is, uh, part of uh, the language. F uh, is not, unless uh, the intervener can provide proof, um, and not traffic proof, but uh, that it adversely impacts the wildlife and the wildlife habitat. 
um, possibly also uh, can the uh, intervener demonstrate how the lighting will impact the wildlife. Uh, G, again, uh, traffic is not environmental in the environmental law, so that does not pertain. And we have H, uh, which talks about uh, feasibility and prudent alternatives. Uh, the suggested uh, alternative is uh, 34 conforming single family homes, um, which right now this parcel is not zoned for single family housing. Uh, but it is um, part of the language to uh, possibly finding, uh, well, if we find there is an impact, uh, we can uh, review feasible uh, modifications to reduce the impact. Uh, so at that point, uh, that's where it's at. Uh, the commission does accept the three uh, petitions. And um, at this time, we could hear from the inter uh, interveners if they would like to make a statement or a presentation. Uh, this would be the time. Uh, I'll ask first if Karen and Gerald uh, are in attendance and if they would like to uh, speak to the commission and interveners will have uh, the same status uh, as the commission members uh, they'll, they are uh, afforded any um, information that comes in from the applicant uh, and they do have the opportunity to speak so uh, again if they would like to speak this is the time Uh, my name is Attorney John Parks. I'm here on behalf of uh, the neighborhood uh, that these interveners come from. And I had a, a couple of um, uh, points that I just wanted to get some clarification on. Some of my uh, clients will be speaking directly tonight, and I will be speaking on behalf of other uh, of my clients. And I'm talking in the range of couple dozen clients and I'm just trying to understand how the three minute rule applies to comments I make on such a wide group. That's a fair question. Uh, there will not be a time limit on intervener okay. because they have the opportunity to do the presentation. They have the same rights basically as the applicant. So um, totally understand that in that respect. That's why I'm trying to get the interveners out of the way first, right. yeah. and, and then will. we will be moving into public comments and reading letters into the record. Right, but as a representative for them, I would have the opportunity to speak, I understand. Okay. Yes. I will sit down and let them speak, and then I would like to speak after that. Okay, fair enough. Okay, are any of the three interveners here and would they like to speak? Uh, Derek Butler or John Hapkowitz? Good evening to the committee. My name is Derek Butler. I live at 596 Governor's Highway. Been in trucking and transportation for 40 plus years. If Derek, if you could please speak into the sure, microphone. Sure, sure. My apologies. I've been in trucking and transportation for 40 plus years. Um, based on my experience in the industry, um, this proposed Talbot Lane operation is too large for the site. Too much activity planned and such a tight area commingled with residential neighborhood. Um, based on the size and scope. The plan structure, the traffic projections were 270 units inbound during the peak hours, AM hours, 250 units in and outbound during the peak evening hours. Um, this will. Excuse me, Derek. 
just yes. as far as the intervener, uh, the truck traffic is not part of that uh, venue, that topic, okay? Um, it, it's not uh, to do with the uh, language that, you know, it's not tied to the air, water, uh, natural resources of the state. Or safety and the, the um, outcome of using town roads for parking and staging. Uh, it, it still the traffic aspect of it is not tied to the environmental law. Okay, well I'll hold and present later. Yeah, but as a as a member of the public, he's allowed to speak as to traffic. Yes, he is because there were traffic uh, right. reports. Okay, and will he be limited to the three minutes on that? Yes. As far as, yes. And should I, could I speak after the interveners are complete with that portion? Or Absolutely. I, okay, then I'll, I'll follow up after. Do we have other interveners here who would like to speak? Yes, Commissioner, this is John Hapkowitz from 44 Cody Circle, and I am a licensed professional engineer in the state of Connecticut, and I'll keep it brief because I know Frank is uh, looking to head out. Um, I don't know if the labeling on my application is similar, numbering. Um, I want to speak to my 4E, if I could. If I'm looking at the, the same copy, it's the degradation of visual, visual quality and alteration. 4B. Four, e. Did you say D or B? E, e as in Edward. Edward. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Please. Okay. And I know the architect, um, he showed two nice renderings from, from views that really don't impact the neighborhood. I would like to request renderings be shown to us as interveners and to you as the as the board to really see what the view from Cody Circle in Edgewood looks today and what the plan is not the five year or the 20 year plan with the with the vegetation but what it's going to look like at day one I'd like to request that um, next was um, item number six just to reinforce that if I could be notified of any other meetings or discussions on on this application I'd, I'd appreciate that and I do have some other economic type comments should I hold those off until the general uh, I believe so because I, okay. I do not believe uh, so I, I, have a, I have a few of those as well but those are more economic related and okay not on the uh, intervener list. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there anyone else as an intervener who would like to speak? Okay, hearing none um, mr. Parks would you like to yes thank you uh, again uh, John Parks uh, I'm representing uh, the residents of the abutting uh, residential neighborhoods in connection with the uh, application before this Commission and the, the magnitude of this type of a proposal uh, in the vicinity, uh, in the midst really of a, a residential uh, subdivision that's established and been there for years requires, um, you know, scrutiny uh, by the board and it requires 
the board to uh, to look to its regulation to see if the interest of all the involved parties are being protected and specifically in connection with this I looked at your um, your uh, table of uses in the uh, section 4.1 because um, the uses listed there for the industrial zone um, are a variety of uses and in fact the uh, design yeah this is the uh, this is the, the design of this building uh, would be applicable uh, we've consulted with experts on this for a number of the uses and some of these uses are combined so that, for example, the, um, the applicant has made reference to this being a warehouse and distribution center, which is uh, allowed as a special permit application. However, the 54 loading docks as well as the 100 truck parking spaces suggest that it would be applicable or available to more uses than just that. And in fact, if we just move up the calendar a little bit and look at freight terminals, this is an issue that, um, in my mind, the applicant has it completely backwards because what the applicant has said, uh, in fact, just said here tonight, is that we want to get all the approvals and then we'll decide if we're going to build it or wait until we get a tenant. So the problem and, and the reason this is backwards is in improving this uh, application, this board needs to know what is going on there, what use is being put, not just what structures, because we've had a very detailed uh, presentation both tonight and previous night uh, about what the structure is going to be like there, but the we don't have any information about what or who is going to be using this site and in your regulation it talks about a narrative statement describing the proposed use we don't have that I, are you under the information that this should be under a special permit absolutely because this is a by site plan that's it's not SP by special is. permit right and that's the problem here that the application has been submitted and then the, bo the board and the staff have just followed suit and no one's asked really press the applicant for what's really going on here. Why, if you're having a warehouse, would you need 54 loading docks and 100 uh, parking places for tractor trailers. We're not warehousing tractor trailers. We're supposedly warehousing things within the the site. And this uh, very question has uh, come come up in the context of Amazon, because what Amazon's done and their business model is is to combine functions into one facility. So in addition to having um, their, uh, their freight terminal, they also have a distribution center and a warehouse. And in fact, in Son Sonoma, California, uh, there was an application. I have a picture of it. I'm submitting it to the and the uh, Sonoma 
Planning and Zoning Commission received an application just like this one. And the applicant, Amazon, stated this was a warehouse and could be approved by special permit, site, site your site plan mm -hmm. in, this, in this zoning regulation. And the town pushed a little bit and asked the hard questions that this applicant needs to be asked who and what is going to go on there because you're talking about several hundred tractor trailer trucks a day you're talking about a facility with 54 loading docks and a hundred parking places it's more than just warehousing and the board in Sonoma found after they asked for that narrative as to what is really going on there that it's it wasn't a storage facility it was a freight terminal so if we get approval first and then ask the question after we either get a tenant uh, after the building has been approved what's going on there now it's too late to uh, to know that we really have a freight terminal here and we never did the uh, criteria. We never went through the criteria. We never asked for a narrative statement. The, uh, is this, as you, you have provisions for in your special exception standard, is this minimal or is there any environmental environmental impacts created? Are there any traffic or other hazards to be created? Now, we're talking about a couple hundred trips going out that very short driveway, down that very short cul-de-sac, and all converging onto Governor's Highway, which is going to inundate that system with a couple hundred tractor trailers at peak hours so why wouldn't we uh, request the type of criteria the review criteria from this applicant and why wouldn't we question um, is this a merely a warehouse and if so why such an extensive um, loading dock and staging area or is this a, uh, a, a, uh, a freight uh, terminal, or is this a combination of them because this exact footprint can be used for either of those? And the applicant's saying is, approve this footprint, we'll tell you what the use is later. And at that point, it's too late because the building is there, we haven't figured out if it will, as is supposed to happen in the approval process, that no traffic or other hazard will be created, we've already got that problem. You already have, and Mr. Butler will uh, confirm and show you pictures, we already have a problem with tractor trailers pulled to the side of Talbot Lane waiting to get into Carla's Pasta. Now we're going to add a couple hundred more trips. Where are those? tractor trailers going to park when they're accessing this property? Are they just going to circle Governor's Highway and keep going around until, until it opens up? They can't even make it into that driveway because that driveway is about one and a half tractor trailer trucks long. So there's, there's no room there. And this, this is the type of criteria that the applicant should be providing to the commission so that we can properly evaluate this. The impact on the capacity and present proposed utilities, drainage systems, other elements will be minimal. We, we have to make that finding. Surrounding property values will be conserved. I submit to you that this room is full tonight because a lot of nervous neighbors are concerned about that very factor. We, we haven't had any questions or any analysis of how this would impact that residential neighborhood. 
The character of the neighbor will be maintained and minimally disrupted. Well, what we're talking about in the application and the plan that's right before you is an operation that's going to go 24-7, 24 hours each day, seven days each week. There will be trucks, hundreds of trucks, pulling in and out of that site while people on Cody Circle are trying to sleep, um, talk on the telephone, enjoy their backyard, just just um, basic uh, life uh, pleasures. And this uh, application, yes, it's true. And Michelle has uh, added to your packet that the um, tractor trailers are exempt from the noise ordinance. However, that does not mean that this board or this town can look the other way when a private nuisance is created for this neighborhood. One tractor trailer, your, your decibel levels in a residential zone are 45 because it's in your packet. One tractor trailer has decibel readings between 78 and 85 decibels. We're having hundreds here. The impact of that on this life quality, I'm going to introduce its common information, and I have a, a printout of it, what the decibels will be. And the, the mere fact that it's exempt, which was something the state did to promote uh, interstate commerce so that trucks could move commerce all over the country, doesn't mean that a property owner can congregate hundreds of them, run them 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in the midst of people trying to live their lives. These decibel readings are harmful to humans at that level. Now, I have a case here. It was next door in um, East Windsor, and it's uh, Victoria O'Neill versus Carolina Freight Carriers. And she had a much smaller, like probably 10% of the size of this, this type of trucking facility next to her residence. And she experienced the same things that this neighborhood has coming, which is noise, constant, loud, disruptive. She went to court, and there was an injunction issued against Carolina Freight, even though the use was allowed under the zoning because it was industrial, it created a nuisance. We are watching a future nuisance right at this commission. I'm introducing um, Victoria O'Neill versus uh, Carolina Freight Corporation. If we look, and I have a, a nice uh, chart that I've made for the uh, commission. It's, I'm introducing that right now. And it, and it talks about the levels of sound and the impact. And at um, 80 decibels, which is in the range for one tractor trailer, possible damage in eight hour exposure. These people are going to be exposed 24 hours a day to 100 of those 80 decibel readings. And that doesn't, that doesn't even cover the, the, the much louder noise when a diesel truck uses jake brakes. Okay, so those decibels spark, spike up into the hundred. Then, or when uh, a tractor trailer backs up to the loading dock and then drops a fully loaded trailer onto pavement, the noise of that. And that's what these people are going to be trying to deal with. And these are noises that this neighborhood won't just hear. This neighborhood will feel those noises. These are noises that cause houses to shake. And they're going to be shaking around the clock. I've given you the table. 
and so I would uh, ask this commission to ask the hard questions of this applicant and apply and, and discern whether this is a use that is appropriate here. I'm running down the, um, the list in uh, 8.4 and I'm down to uh, number nine. The character of the neighborhood will be maintained or minimally disrupted. We're talking about a 40 foot tall, nine acre building um, on a property that has hundreds of tractor trailers associated with it. This is a big change to the character of this neighborhood, not only visually, but audibly uh, and traffic congestion wise. Number 10, the general welfare of the community will be served. Well, I listened to the entire meeting last time. I, lit, I sat through the entire meeting this time and there's only one positive thing that I heard about this application. No one here is saying this is a good idea. The one positive thing I heard was that the town of South Windsor will make $700,000 more in taxes. Well, please. If, if you can't <clears throat> live in your house because the noise is driving you out, if you get sick, because of this constant irritating sounds that you're, you're dealing with, that money's not gonna matter to you. I mean, that money's not going to this neighborhood and it, and it no way replaces uh, what they have. It, it, and number 11 is there's a balance between neighborhood acceptance and community need. Where's the community need? I, I didn't hear one person say, I need a hundred tractor trailers in my backyard because of, we don't need a hundred tractor trailers in our backyard. This, this Mr. Butler was, was exactly correct, and we'll hear from him next, I hope, that the, this plan is way bigger and there's been no prudent alternative. They showed at the wetlands a building half the size and said there was no market for it. And then we had expert testimony said, sure, there's a market for it, but you're just not gonna make as much money. They said, well, it's gonna cost as much to build the, the nine acre building as it would be cost to build the four and a half acre building. Well, that made no sense. It's price per square foot. This is twice as big. It would cost twice as much. So these factors need to be considered. This uh, special permit process needs to be evaluated. Is this train even on the right track for the type of use, the intensity and the scope of the use that's gonna be dropped in the midst of this residential neighborhood. I, I think we're far, and, and we have far too many unanswered questions that the applicant needs to, to, to um, supply. I mean, at the last hearing, well, we don't know who the tenant is. Well, then how do you know that you need 54 uh, loading docks? How do you know that you need 100 uh, tractor trailer parking. Do you mean to tell me you're building a nine <coughs> acre spec building? You're not building a nine acre spec building. There, there's someone in the wings. There's more that we need to ask and there's more that we need to know about what's going on inside that big building that they propose. We know everything about the outside. We don't know what's going on on the inside. And I believe that this commission needs to know what's going on in the inside to determine if we're, we're reviewing this with the proper criteria. And, and I'd suggest to you that the, the scope of this 
warrants that type of scrutiny um, by this commission. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at this time, uh, could we get people to sign in, please? When you yeah, I apologize. Um, anyone address. who comes up, we ask that you sign in on our sign-in sheet. Uh, uh, Michelle, right now, um, we accepted this application under a warehouse and distribution centers. That's um, what the request is. It is not a request for a um, freight terminal. Um, so it is a site plan application. It's not a special exception request. I think the applicant would probably verify that. But it is not, it's, it's under warehouse distribution facility. Right. That is correct. We applied only for a site plan application approval for a distribution center and warehouse. Um, it is permitted by right. It's not a special exception uh, application. It does not have those 14 review criteria that you find in your zoning regulations for special exception use that Ms. Attorney Park was citing. Um, those do not apply to this application. Thank you. Uh, uh, Peter, could you step back up for a minute? Yes, sir. Um, how, how does the commission determine uh, whether or not it's actually a warehouse distribution center versus uh, like a truck or freight terminal? Yeah, um, we've done enough of these. I can tell you this is what they do. They have lots of loading docks and lots of trailer parking spaces and they're big wide buildings um, as opposed to let, let's say uh, there's freight terminal for example on Sullivan Avenue which is a thin building uh, where the trucks come on either side of it. Uh, they quickly load up and are gone as opposed to a distribution center where you're storing items and then distributing them later on. Uh, this is completely different you need a lot more storage for these types of facilities, distribution centers, to distribute pro product as opposed to a trucking freight terminal. Um, we've applied uh, for the Hyundai Mobis facility as a distribution center. We have loading docks on the east side of that building, extensive parking um, throughout the site, uh, and, and a lot of loading docks on the entire east, if I recall correctly, is to to entire east side of the building. Uh, next to it is Performance Food Group, the Vistar building, another large building. Uh, that you have approved as well. It is loading docks on its entire west side, the entire length of the building. Um, this is quite common for just, and it's a big wide building and they're storing in there uh, food products for the most part. Um, automobile parts for Hyundai, for their truck and cars uh, throughout the Northeast. So those are common distribution centers. Um, Home Depot is a distribution center. It's not a truck terminal mm -hmm. uh, as you, and they're storing lots of things on site. Um, and these are commonplace, they're large, they have lots of loading docks, trailer storage, parking for their employees, sometimes not as much as this, but we're meeting zoning by showing this. Um, hopefully we don't need the, that as much, we can return to you later um, for um, a reserve parking. But uh, this is typical of, of that. We had testimony at the wetlands meeting from uh, an expert, uh, Sean Duffy, who is an expert in this field, he can tell you all about these facilities. Um, we had testimony at prior hearing. Uh, maybe we can get something from him uh, for the next hearing. Uh, but this is absolutely a distribution center. And okay. with respect to why we haven't identified a particular tenant, we don't have one right now. However, if we did have one, which is typical, you don't identify because the tenants will not let you identify them in 90% of the cases. You, they're not identified up front. Uh, uh, the tenant will not allow you to identify them. They don't want to be identified until the approvals are in place. And you often don't have a, a signed tenant until after all the approvals are in place. And they know exactly when the building can be delivered because it has to fit their schedule of when they need facilities in certain areas. Uh, and they're not going to commit until they know when you can deliver this building. And right now, we don't know exactly when we can deliver this building. So as with the other sites you've approved recently, we usually did not reveal to you who they were because there wasn't a signed tenant and until you do that, they won't let you do it anyways. So we cannot identify them at this time, even if we had one, and we do not. Yeah. 
uh, thank you, Ben. Yes, and uh, MOBIS and VISTAR were approved as site plans as distribution centers by this commission under your, in accordance with your regulations. And the special exception review criteria that Ms. Attorney Park was mentioning do not apply. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. John E. Holizak, Cody Circle, 27 year resident. For the record, I am not an intervener um, in this planning and zoning matter, and neither is my wife. Um, could I have the tables up here real quickly? There's an additional item besides a freight terminal that deserves your consideration. If you look down, and, and SP does stand for site plan, okay? A lot of us are tired. We've been up late nights trying to figure all this out, in addition to doing our day jobs. Um, if you look here, warehouses and distribution centers, mm -hmm. yes, SP, site plan, stands for site plan. Nothing special about it. Look down to the next line. Wholesale sales and inventory directly related thereto. Now, I think we've established in front of multiple commissions that I am not a lawyer, but I believe this line refers to this line. So without having a detailed understanding of who the tenant is, how do you know that they're not gonna engage in wholesale warehousing? where a special exception would apply and where our property values would get some consideration. Thank you. Okay. Um, at Commissioner, may I just? Sure. Uh, for the record, John Parks, the, the dilemma for the board is that none of the terms um, listed on that table are defined within your regulation. So we're left to determining what they mean by, you know, normal procedures like how in the industry and um, uh, how they're, like for example, Webster's Dictionary for freight. I, I think at this point, uh, Mr. Butler would be helpful because he operates facilities just like this and he knows why uh, things are laid out in a certain way for, for what function, which I think would be very helpful uh, to understand what function could occur on this design building. Thank you. Okay, would Mr. Butler come forward, please? Mm -hmm. I'll just remind you, Mr. Butler, if you could, um, three minute time limit. Sure. Um, so try and get everything out. Um, Absolutely. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. So once again, just to review what I started before, I think this, this operation, what's proposed here, um, let's talk about the operation, just because of the size and scope of it. I don't believe you put a building up like this on spec. I think it's predetermined who and what's going in there, but we'll, we'll touch that later. Um, in terms of volume, truck volume, um, again, during peak hours, this is from the applicant's traffic study, um, 270 units during the peak AM hours, 250 during the peak PM hours. Um, it's almost equivalent to, during those peak times, a truck a minute, in and out. Um, operational, operational wise, um, to have that kind of traffic volume with only 54 loading docks creates a backlog. Um, on average, it takes 50, 45 to 50 minutes to check in a truck and unload it. If you're getting in a truck, and, uh, a, truck a minute, right off the bat, even operating at 100% efficiency, you know, you're creating a backlog of five, six, seven trailers per hour. Um, there's no room on the applicant's site to stage that much equipment. The driveway is too small and it's going to create backlog into Talbot Lane and back up into Governor's Highway. So um, I've put together something. I've got a, some exhibits I'd like to share. Yeah. 
All right, so uh, if you just go right to the first page, Exhibit A, uh, it, it kind of shows, uh, it shows the Coke building and the long driveway that was planned off of the main Route 30, um, long enough for staging and check-in. Um, if you flip over to the second, Exhibit B, uh, it shows the Amazon DC-1 warehouse at 100 Helmsford Way in Windsor. Um, once again, if you take a look in pink, it shows that long access driveway to get to the site in the load and unload area. Exhibit C, the third page, is a snapshot overhead of the Amazon DC-2 facility in Windsor. Once again, I've highlighted the, in pink that long driveway that goes from the, the, the main artery uh, into their site and uh, into the truck well. The next exhibit, if you go to the next page, it's just a quick snapshot of the applicant's property. And if you take a look, there's a big difference between the driveway plan for this site and what the other distribution and trucking facilities are using for staging. Um, it's going to create backup on the streets. It's going to create backup on Talbot Lane, Governor's Highway, all the way down to Route 5. Um, the next page, Exhibit E, black and white photo with yellow and pink um, highlighted zones. The yellow highlight shows the areas that would be impacted by truck backup and, and staging area needed. Um, the pink shows the areas that are already used for staging that are already congested without adding this additional volume. Um, to the right, uh, it's where the applicant site is. That's the Talbot Lane Circle. Um, not a lot of people know, but it's already being used for staging for trucks waiting to get into the Carlos, Pro uh, Carlos Pasta property. Mr. Butler, do you have much more? A little bit more. I'll be finished in just a second. Okay. Um, Thank you. The second area intersection of Governors and Route 5 shows area that's already during peak hours gets backed up from Macy's traffic. Now I know in a lot of the reports, you know, it was stated that the signs will reduce tractor, tra tractor trailer activity on Governor's Highway, but it, it hasn't done anything. Um, this next section shows, this is right in front of my house, Two snapshots, that's just from this weekend, truck traffic on Governor's Highway existing. Adding 40 times the volume is gonna make it worse. Okay. Okay. Can I yield my time to him, please? Peter, and Peter Andrews, AD Cody Circle. Can I yield my three minutes to him? Okay. Thank you. Um, in Exhibit F, this is a snapshot of the circle at Talbot Lane. This shows trucks parked in the circle stage waiting to get into Carlos Pasta. So the applicant's driveway enters right from that circle. It's already being used for staging. On a given day, this was last Friday, Carlos Pasta had four trucks in and four trucks out. Just from the four, this first page shows what's staged in the circle. Second page shows what's staged in the circle. The next page shows what's staged at the exit of Carlos Pasta, intersecting Nutmeg Road. And the last page of this exhibit shows the first truck that came out of Carlos Pasta that exited, went to Route 5, turned left, parked 300 feet from the intersection, and waited and staged there for hours. Again, I wanted to just re rehash, recap the trailer activity current. It's always been a, an issue for us. Nothing slowed it down. Adding this much traffic is going to be detrimental to the neighborhood. Quality of living, house values. I went out today to take pictures of the intersection of Governor's Highway and Talbot Lane. This is the last. 
that one in? Uh, yeah. Okay. So this is four o'clock today. It shows a solid trailer coming from the intersection of Route 30 and Governor's Highway towards me on Governor's Highway, even though there's a sign there. But then the second picture shows this tight intersection. So this intersection shows Talbot Lane, it's 33 feet wide um, on Governor's Highway from the yellow two lane uh, in the middle of the road to the curb is 16 feet on one side, 16 feet on the other, impossible for a 68, 70 foot long unit to be able to make that turn with others lined up trying to exit the property. It's just too tight, too much traffic planned with this operation. Um, you're gonna have backups on Talbot, you will have backups on Governor's Highway making the area unsafe. It just proves that this, this facility, this operation, this plan is just, it's too big for that area with the neighborhood uh, commingled in it. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, at this time, we have some letters to read into the record. Um, I'll ask the secretary to start on those. <laughs> October 24, 2021, Town of South Windsor Planning and Zoning Commission. Dear commissioners, my family and I are direct abutters to the proposed distribution center at 25 Talbot Lane. I strongly oppose this development as an operation of this massive scale will significantly diminish my family's quality of life and that of our community. A 360,000 square foot warehouse with 54 loading docks creates loud, harsh, quality of life destroying activity. Along with other obvious concerns such as traffic, safety, pollution, and being an eyesore, this 24-7 beehive of diesel tractor commotion will include moving trailers, idling, honking, and the constant metallic banging from dropping and picking up trailers that will overrun any sense of peace for a half mile. This nightmare scenario is apparent at the first glance of the site plan and its proximity to dense residential housing. Every neighbor has their own unique personal story on why it will destroy their quality of life, and I will share ours. Our daughter is a medically, medically fragile 11-year-old with severe disabilities. She is nonverbal and legally blind. Because of her challenges, she spends 99% of her life on our property. Even the school system comes to our house to educate her. Our house and our yard are for all purposes her world. It is impossible to underestimate the effect of such a massive around-the-clock trucking fleet and outdoor mega warehouse operations to her quality of life. She doesn't have the ability to get away from the noise, which is so detrimental towards her strongest and most critical sense hearing. My daughter was dealt a difficult hand, but this project compounds it. I would also like to point out that there have been two town blind child area street signs on Cody Circle for over two years prior to the applicant's purchase of this property. Sincerely, Susan Delhay. Please, no outbursts, it just takes away from our time. Uh, the next letter is a letter of support from South Windsor Economic Development Commission. Dear commissioners, please be advised that the Town of South Windsor Economic Development Commission at its regular meeting on July 28, 2021, voted by majority to send a letter of support regarding the 25 Talbot Lane project. Sincerely, Paul Burnham. Good evening. My name is Wayne Botha, and I live at 720 Governor's Highway. I wish to thank you commissioners for your service. I appreciate that you invest your time and energy to help direct prudent and sustainable development in our town. I submitted written testimony because I am from South Africa and sometimes my accent gets in the way of the message. I am proud to be a U.S. citizen and live in South Windsor. I chose to establish my family in South Windsor because our town used to have a rural feel with open spaces and wildlife in the wetlands. I have wild deer that come into my yard to snack on my shrubs, yet I still get a thrill watching them wander around with their young ones in the woods next to our property. I am strongly op opposed to this distribution center. This distribution center is the wrong development for this site. I have had the opportunity to attend the Inlands Commission and Economic Development meetings for this application and have followed the evolution of this proposal. 
For context, just imagine the FedEx building next to your house. The proposed distribution center is 359,654 square feet and is bigger than the FedEx building on Sullivan Avenue, which is 301,011 square feet, and 1.7 times bigger than the Coca-Cola building on Ellington Road, which is 209,744 square feet, as submitted by Donald Pullen, PhD in the Municipal Fiscal Impact Analysis. Design professional confirmed to the Economic Development Commission that there will not be any restrictions on a tenant regarding this type of operation for the distribution center. This will be a 24-hour operation year-round located right next to a residential development with tractor-trailer traffic as described in the applicant's traffic analysis. Additionally, the study completed amidst the intersection of Belden Road and Ellington Road. The reason this is an important intersection is because if you are traveling on Governor's Highway and Skip want to... It. You skipped the page. I did? Oh, I'm sorry. I did skip that. I did not skip the page. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. For the record, <laughs> for the record, my opposition to this development is the following. Increased tractor trailer traffic and Governor's Highway, despite the town ordinance of Governor's Highway and Belden Road, which is not enforced. Noise from the distribution center, especially on weekends. Being left with a deserted building at some future date, such as a Mestec building at 515 John Fitch Boulevard. Significant decrease in property value because many people choose to live in South Windsor for the same reason I do, namely open space and wildlife. We have abandoned buildings and open space along Sullivan Avenue and on John Fitch Boulevard that is available and much more appropriate for distribution centers. The only upside to this development is the highly spec speculative tax revenue to our town of approximately 500000 per year, which will only be realized after the building is complete, occupied, and if the town does not offer tax incentives to the proposed tenant. Therefore, our town is guaranteed to have a lower quality of life with a potential prospect of slightly larger tax base. The guaranteed town size of this development far outweighs the single potential upside. I understand that the applicant has requested a property tax abatement. So not only are taxpayers being harmed by the impact of this project in terms of the adverse impact to their property values, they are being asked to subsidize it for at least a decade if the tax abatement is granted. I request the Planning and Zoning Commission consider the following regard in this application. A, review the traffic study, impact study submitted by the applicant regarding school bus impacts. The traffic study was conducted in June 2021 during school summer months. No school or school bus traffic was captured, and while town schools and workplace shutdowns were still going on due to the public health concerns. I searched a traffic impact study and do not find every, any references to the fact that the Datco bus yard is located on 660 Nutmeg Road North. One of the major school bus routes in South Windsor is along Nutmeg Road, and then on Governor's Highway and Belden to Ellington Road. Our school bus routes will be impacted by the increased tractor trailer traffic as school bus peak travel times conflict with peak times now you have one more page. indicated in the traffic impact study. Additionally, the study com completely omits the intersection of Belden Road and Ellington Road. The reason this is an important intersection is because if you are traveling down Governor's Highway and want to go south on Ellington Road, you would turn right down Belden Road an exit at the intersection of Belden and Ellington. If you wanted to travel north, you would exit at the Governor's Highway, Ellington Road, Podunk Circle at intersection. With all of that in mind, it's obvious that the applicant's traffic impact study is missing a significant amount of vehicle traffic that traverses the study area and is per se invalid. Understand the Governor's Highway entrance on this proposal distribution site. At the Wellens Commission, the plan was to have the Governor's Highway gate closed and only be used for emergency access. At the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, the plan showed that the gate will be used for automobiles. I requested the Commission to get confirmation on a final plan for entrances and traffic flow. The plan for this property has evolved during presentations to each of the Commissions over the past few months. The Wellens Commissions and EDC were presented with prior versions of this plan and deliberated on proposals pre presented. I request that the Planning and Zoning Commission invite the applicant to present the single final plan so that the EDC and Inlands Commission agree can confirm their decisions. Otherwise, the Wetlands, EDC, and Planning and Zoning Commissions are deliberating on different versions of the plan for the proposed development. 
Design professionals proposed several versions of residential development on this property in the past, including 34 conform conforming lots of single family homes, which was not feasible at that time, partially because the property was zoned commercial. Times have changed and now have neighborhoods developed around this property. I request this commission be open to consider other options for this property, such as allowing variances for this property to allow construction of similar residential units as previously proposed if such an application were submitted. I again thank you for your time volunteering for planning and zoning commission and now allowing public input. I don't know if there's a name. This is an email submitted by Gary Crenshaw on October 13th, 2021. Hello, commissioners. I attended last night's meeting regarding the distribution warehouse proposal. I live at 113 Edgewood Drive and learned that the location of loading docks was proposed to be moved entirely to the westerly side of the building. Last night I wanted to speak but did not have the slide up as a reference guide, so I thought to ask my question with this online comment. Since I am facing the woods across the street from that westerly corner, I am most likely going to be impacted by the sounds of trucks offloading and commuting to and from the loading docks at various hours of the day and night. I purchased my property for the quiet, picturesque view of the woods, which has not been disturbed since we moved here. I understand the ep economic aspects of gaining this tenant, but I could see many of you had questions about the noise and traffic and safety of the site. My home is my investment, which will undoubtedly decrease in value if this project is allowed to proceed. I have paid my taxes, which at one one hundredth of the gross taxes this building will generate, yet I feel my rights as a resident, like others, to live in peace with the best quality of life I can provide for my family. I can honestly say that regardless of the buffers and berms and architectural landscaping and barrier trees, abutters, and our entire neighborhood will suffer from this development. Through the noise it will generate in the fall and winter with no leaves on trees to act as soundproofing. May I say, we heard Carla's pasta. We constantly hear a car stereo business testing their installation through the thickest forest. We will certainly hear the sounds of diesel trucks and air brakes and people moving around at all hours if this is allowed to proceed. We will smell the diesel fumes from a distance. We will lose thousands of dollars in equity on our homes as I have worked so hard to achieve curb appeal and all my upgrades will be absorbed in the losses I will take for facing this distribution warehouse, which currently has no tenant at the moment. Perhaps it would be fair if I was offered some compensation for my loss of sleep, compromised view of a warehouse, or my 30% projected loss of equity in my home. I realize that I represent only one one hundredth of the potential tax revenue, tax revenue to be collected by this project. I also realize that the owners bought this property and intended to use it for the industrially zoned location and that they are meeting or exceeding requirements which make it difficult to reject such a project. As I humbly submit to you today, an entire neighborhood is at risk of being damaged by the proximity of this building. The distances from this building to the nearest resident could be 500 feet, and we would still hear and feel the economic loss and beautification of an older development that all of our neighbors take great pride in. South Windsor could not afford to lose all of its prime wooded property to develop distribution type buildings. Who will wanna live in South Windsor if we keep up this de de developmental trend? I submit to you all in the most sincere manner. The proud neighbors of Cody Circle and Edgewood Drive will suffer from this project. I'd be happy if another housing development was allowed to proceed here, but not this warehouse. It's like a giant square box amongst a circle of beautiful homes that we all take pride in maintaining. I appreciate each commissioner's questions and the fairness you have shown in these proceedings thus far. Sincerely, Gary Crenshaw, 113 Edgewood Drive. We have one. Fair Planning and Zoning Commission, I am writing in regards to the application for a warehouse at the Talbot Lane Air site. According to the Hartford Business Journal, this would be a massive warehouse with 54 loading docks and 118 parking spaces for trailers. It is hard to see how a business of this size would not negatively impact the surrounding residential area. It seems to me that it might be in the town's best interest to revisit our zoning laws and regulations to better articulate and detail what type of commercial buildings can go where. The rise of e-commerce has changed the game and our zoning regulations should be updated for today's realities. 
I understand why these companies would want to be here. South Windsor is at the crossing points of 84 and 91. Sensible zoning and sensible town planning should include creating a plan for where warehouses of this scale can be placed and where commercial trucks may travel. If our town is hoping to grow our tax base from these warehouses, it should be equally concerned about how the quality of life is being impacted by the encroaching proximity of the warehouses themselves to residential areas, but also the fact that the commercial truck traffic actually expands their fo footprint into residential areas. Until such plans are made, I am against a warehouse of this scale being put at Talbot Road or any other location in town. Regards, Jared Lewis, 170 Long Hill Road. And with that, that's, I believe, our orders, right? Okay, thank you. At this time, uh, we'll still hear uh, more from the public. Uh, first, those in favor, uh, and then from those who have questions or concerns or are against the application. So um, I'll remind anyone who comes up, if you could please sign in and uh, introduce yourself to the commission. Is there anyone else who would like to speak in favor of this application? Gem gentleman with the mask? No? Oh, okay. <laughs> against, okay. Uh, anyone else who would like to speak in favor of this application, please step forward. Hearing and seeing none, is there anyone who would like to speak against? or have questions or concerns? Gentleman with the glasses and the mask. Good evening, can you hear me okay? Yes, I can, thank uh, you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I'm Tim Wenzel, 630 Governor's Highway. Uh, I guess I'd like to speak to really a couple issues. Uh, having served on your commission for approximately 10 years, I do appreciate the difficult task you have but I'd like to give you a little bit of history that hasn't come up because I have lived in town for many years. This property, as you likely know, was not always owned industrial. This was agricultural, and when town center, which was going to be a huge development at the end of town, came in, it was with promises there was going to be a skyscraper. The only thing that was actually created was the Fire Lanes Warehouse, which now has several different names. So this sentiment that I keep hearing that the zoning of industrial is sacred and can never be changed is really, I think, a mistake. This property is misowned. Once we allowed residential development on three sides of the property, at that point, I think we should have recognized, and it's partially my fault as well, and I understand that, that this piece of property, albeit zoned industrial, doesn't meet the criteria necessary to or for that. Because there are residential houses on basically three sides of this property, yes, it's industrial by history, but not permanent history. It's been changed before, other people, other pieces of land have changed, and I think it's appropriate for the alternatives review to not be dismissed because it would require a zoning change. I think that's a big mistake. Zone changes do happen. This commission has approved some recently. I think in this case, when it's recognized that perhaps this is just a mistake waiting to happen, that it's mis-zoned presently by history, um, it's time to relook at that whole issue and certainly not to dismiss the alternative uses because they would require a zone change. That's within your ability to do and of sorts, kind of your obligation to really consider seriously just because there's a reason there's so many people here tonight and at all of these other meetings. Sometimes an application just doesn't fit. The other thing I'd like to mention is I was on this commission when the Filings Warehouse did the expansion and they told us that all traffic would be a nutmeg. That never happened. From day one, they continued to use Governor's Highway and their trucks and other trucks are routinely routed. When we heard this evening some review by the town attorney that perhaps the town could not limit truck traffic, you've really changed things an awful lot as well. Governor's Highway is overburdened 
especially at night. Obviously, they understand that people don't watch it enough at night, but I live there. At nighttime, it's a continuous train of tracks and trucks tractor trailer trucks much more so than during the day excuse me mr wentzel do you have much more i will try to go fast i apologize okay, okay. hopefully if what i'm ha saying has some meaning to us the other thing if you should approve this application and i certainly hope you don't i think there are methodologies that you could implement for the design of the entrances where truck traffic couldn't physically make a right hand turn out of either the site or talbot an example of this might be uh, McDonald's on Route 5, where the entrances are configured such that that can't occur. If the town is not able to ban traffic there, which we've heard tonight is perhaps problematic, certainly by a geometry change of both the entrance to this site as well as Talbert Lane could make it such that truck traffic's could not make a right-hand turn, nor could they make a left-hand turn if they're going west on Governor's Highway. That would at least solve the problem for this site in a way that could, the geometry, you wouldn't have to then have enforcement for. Sorry if I've gone over my time. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak against or have questions or concerns? A young lady with the black mask. Hi, uh, Janet Giamarino. I live on 139 Judy Lane, and we've been in town um, since 2004. Uh, I've been teaching in town uh, since 2000, um, and we bought our property um, in South Windsor specifically so that my husband's children could continue to go to school here. We love our house. We are the second owners of our house that was built in 1961. That's not an anomaly on my street. There are still original owners on my street because our neighborhood is fabulous. My children grew up in, we later went on to have two more children, and our neighbors are wonderful, and we are what I call the triangle of safety, and we've been encroached upon and encroached upon in these past few years. Uh, this past April, we've had issues with, um, we are not an exact a butter of what's being proposed, but we have industrial behind us. And the industrial um, buffer zone has been uh, depleted over the years. We brought this to the town's attention and the owners of that property uh, fixed the problem by installing two and a half feet tall trees. And there's nothing else being done. I oppose this building for all of the reasons everybody has already said. And it will be a disgrace to our town. And I don't even think this so-called tax money that would be coming in would have any impact on the lives of the residents of this town. And I vehemently oppose it. Jen, could I get your address again, please? Judy Lane, Judy 139 Lane. Judy Lane. Thank you. Okay. Uh, After you will be the gentleman in the white shirt with the mask on at the door. All right, hello, commissioners. Uh, thank you for your time. I'm gonna try to go through 13 points as quickly as I can here, I know I only have three minutes. Um, my name is Dane Matron. I live at uh, 18 Edgewood Drive, so just outside the abutter zone. Um, I've lived in uh, South Windsor my entire life. I'm 30 years old. I uh, went to UConn, uh, mechanical engineering degree and MBA from UConn as well, but I do want to note that I'm not a uh, licensed professional engineer or a traffic engineer. Um, so the first thing I want to address is that the, uh, the traffic impact study failed to address the impact of non-tractor trailer vehicles that are turning right uh, when they exit the uh, site. Uh, so this would be going east on Governor's Highway, which could potentially bring them to uh, Belden Road and then uh, the intersection of Ellington. Now, just this past summer, uh, I witnessed a T-bone accident right there um, uh, of a, with a white Tesla. One of my neighbors actually got hit. And uh, this would be a intersection that could potentially be used by non-tractor trailer traffic that would be allowed to take a right out of that governor, uh, governor's highway entrance. So I know it was mentioned there's 333 parking spaces that are not for tractor trailers. That means there's an extensive amount of traffic um, that can be generated that's not just from the trucks. 
and I don't think that's been accounted for when we're talking about taking a left versus a right-hand turn onto Governor's Highway. Uh, this also, uh, uh, the impact study, the traffic impact study um, provide an overview of the intersection site distance. Uh, the report does say that there would be no impact to safety for vehicles entering and exiting. Uh, I do have some meeting minutes from one of these hearings in 2018, which I can, which I can provide. Um, that actually have a, a contradictory statement by uh, the uh, someone from police services, which said the Baker Lane sight line, which is directly uh, parallel to that uh, governor's highway entrance, uh, does not have an adequate sight line. Um, the next thing is uh, I personally sat at the traffic light, uh, which is the intersection of John Fitch Boulevard and Governor's Highway. Uh, that light uh, that allows you to take a left or right onto, onto John Fitch Boulevard is only 18 seconds. Uh, you can fit two, maybe three trucks through this light before the light turns red. And that is if you don't have any other cars or anything uh, in that uh, line waiting to go through that light. And that also doesn't account for if you have cross traffic coming from the other side uh, on Governor's Highway on the other side of John Fitch Boulevard, in which case if you're taking a left, you'd have to wait before the, tra the tractor trailers could, could gain access to uh, John Fitch Boulevard. Um, so I, I, I did note in the traffic report as well that it said that there could be an adjustment to the, the timing of the light in order to optimize uh, how quickly traffic could get onto uh, John Fitch Boulevard. Um, I think that if they were willing to make that statement, you'd have to then analyze what the impact of that timing would be. So if you're going to make, let's say, the light longer uh, to get onto John Fitch Boulevard, then you would have to analyze the impact to the traffic that is going on John Fitch Boulevard as well. So I think it's uh, insufficient to just say you can adjust the timing of the light and not do any traffic impact analysis to support that. Um, I'm just going to try to read in a couple things from uh, someone who can be here with us uh, way. He just got his second COVID shot and he is not uh, feeling well. Um, Excuse me, do you have much more? Uh, I'm just going to try to hit some of the high points here. So um, just like one more minute. Okay. Um, so the traffic impact study failed to adjust the impact um, from school bus traffic uh, on school days. Uh, it was the study was conducted in June of 2021. Um, there was no schools the summertime and also the midst of a pandemic. Um, there was also no uh, impact study done with regards to the rail track that's on Governor's Highway that does impact the traffic. So you you can't have a, a truck or any uh, traffic sitting on the rail tracks. Um, and if you are a bus or some other vehicle like that, you have to stop, open your doors, listen for the train, close them, and, th and then you can go down the tracks. Um, so that, was, that did not seem to be taken into account. Um, there was also the, the, there's an area near the proposed development. Uh, there's two large DATCO school bus yards. I think that was already mentioned. So I have a map which I can submit here as well that shows, uh, it doesn't seem to be any uh, analysis of the uh, interaction between these, these buses and these trucks. Um, and also there is a new daycare center uh, that has been approved by Planning and Zoning Commission commission uh, called Precisely Pandas. It is uh, directly across the street at that John Fitch Boulevard and Governor's Highway entrance. Uh, that application is 21-17P. Um, and so that is contradictory to say that there was no uh, outstanding planning and zoning applications when this traffic study was done. So I wanted to note that. Um, and one more point, which is uh, that the accident count in this area roadway network is completely wrong. So uh, in the tra in traffic impact study, uh, on page 11, table five in the accident data summary, uh, it is only listed one accident on John Fitch Boulevard and Governor's Highway. I personally witnessed more, more accidents than that myself. Um, in fact, the Yukon uh, crash data repository shows there were nine crashes at this intersection between 2018 and 2020. Uh, I actually just saw one in that um, Belden Road area just this past summer as well. Um, so I would suggest that that crash data repository is double checked because the numbers don't match up with what was submitted in the impact study. Um, and the last thing is the possible additional air pollution generated by the trucks serving this warehouse will add to the existing emissions from other large vehicles, namely the Echo School Bus Company, 
um, which actually was sued by Conservation Law Foundation for violating the Clean Air Act in Connecticut. The bus company was accused of spreading toxic exhaust into areas near homes, schools, and churches and parks. The lawsuit includes the Nutmeg uh, Road School Bus Yard in South Windsor, which is only a few thousand feet away from this warehouse project. Uh, excessive idling was observed on Nutmeg Road School Bus Yard, according to the pl plaintiff's data. Uh, on October 14th of 2021, which is just a couple weeks ago, DATCO reached a settlement with the plaintiff. The settlement requires DATCO to commit $1.8 million to the transition to a zero emissions fleet, uh, including purchasing vehicles, charging stations, and other infrastructure upgrades. The company must also install an automatic engine shutoff technology in its entire coach fleet and on all its large diesel school buses. Finally, DATCO must increase its monitoring of vehicle idling and make that data available in the semi-annual reports. Um, I mean, I, I think that kind of speaks for itself. Uh, we're gonna have this same problem to an even larger extent with these, with this proposed plan. So I have a few more things, but I'm just gonna submit it all uh, here and you guys can please take a look at it at your uh, convenience. That's it. Okay, thank you. Did you sign in? Okay. Is there anyone else who would like to speak against or? Uh, I did say the gentleman with the white shirt would be next. Um, <laughs> I apologize, you'll be next after that gentleman. <laughs> and I'm doing an awful job sticking to the three minutes. I'm trying to be considerate of the public, but I really do need to try and stick to that three minutes so everybody gets a chance to speak. Hi, my name is Paul Lepentin. I live on 168 Edgewood Drive. Um, now, I have some questions for the applicant. Do I address it to you people, uh, the board, and you ask the question to them? Yeah, you address I ask directly? the commission, and then when the commission has their uh, time at the applicant, will address your concerns. Well, one of the things I was wondering if they could put up that other uh, thing about the drainage, the other schematic, or uh, is that possible? If not, we'll have to. I'm sure it probably I mean, they're is willing. They want to work with us. Possible. I know they're here to work with us. So if they want to put it up. I... Peter, is that up or Ben? Is that possible? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Well, um, I thought there was another one. I, was this the one the gentleman in the green shirt had put up? Yes. Yeah. Well, I couldn't understand what he was saying before because he wasn't talking loud enough. But there is another schematic on the drainage ditch, but you're probably aware of it. Um, so the applicant said they do a lot of these. Um, these types of constructions were built. So we must uh, consider us some type of expert in this type of the field with buildings and land use and the whole everything. Now, they plan for the future. I can tell that. So there is a storm drain they say that they're, they're going to, how much water are they going to put in the, into that storm drain system? I couldn't hear exactly how much it was. Do you know offhand or? Uh, what was that, Steve? 21.332 feet per second. I can't hear you guys. You don't talk loud enough. 21.33 cubic feet per second. Is that a lot of water? <laughs> Significant. That's a lot of water, right? Okay. I just didn't know. I don't know any of this. That's why I ask you guys, and that's why I ask the experts. Are they experts? Do they know what they're doing? Do you know what you're doing? They, oh, I can't me. ask that. Excuse me. Do they know what please, they're doing? Please don't disparage the applicant. I'm not disparaging. I'm okay. asking if they know what they're okay. doing. Okay, and you need to address the chair. So 
All you, right, so you can find that out. Okay. You need to. So the last rainstorm, uh, during that big torrential rainstorm, a lot of us got water in our basements that never got water before. And they say they're going to put that astronomical amount of water into that drainage system and that it will handle it. And it's going to go under Route 5 and down to the Conega River. So when they were out there, they must have researched the drainage system all the way to under Route 5, because they know what they're doing. They do this all the time. Now, let's please please address the chair. Yes, well, I'm pointing to, I don't have any schematics. This is kind of old school, is that all right? Yes. Okay. So see, this is Nutmeg Road South. I, I cannot see what you're... This line here. Okay. And if you keep going, you, you if do you have keep to going speak. straight, you're going to go into a factory. This would be the driveway into the factory. At, I think it's 350 Nutmeg Road South. Nutmeg Road South makes a right and then makes a left and goes out to Connecticut Avenue. Between, between this driveway and where it comes over here, Nutmeg Road South, is a retention pond. I don't know what to call it. The water from Carlos Pasta and this new building that they're proposing is going to come down that drainage ditch, is supposed to come down that drainage ditch, go under Nutmeg Road South, and go out underneath Route 5. Well, when the gentleman was there, they must uh, uh, know what the flow rate was of the water going under Route 5. I was there yesterday. There is no water going underneath the driveway where the drainage ditch they referenced. And there's dead water. There's dead water in the pond, and there's no water in the drainage ditch that goes under Route 5. Now, it stands to reason. Now, this place hasn't been built yet. But as of it is now, the water that doesn't go underneath this driveway to the factory, it backs up. If the water can't get to Route 5, it's only going to go one way. It's going to go towards Edgewich Drive. Okay, and please speak into the microphone. I'm sorry? I couldn't hear you. You're not speaking into no, the microphone. It's going to go towards Edgewood Drive. Water seeks its, its um, own uh, spot where it can go, the least resistance. If it can't go to the Connecticut River, there's only one way to go. So they're, they're saying that the drainage system now will handle what future thing they want to do. It can't handle what's there now. Go down there tomorrow morning. Well, he's already been there because they're experts. They checked everything. Okay. You understand? No, I mean, I, I I'm understand. Not, I'm, I'm giving, I should have maybe been on for them. You are over your limit, though. Do you have now, much more? Huh? You are over your limit. Do you yeah, have much I got more? Yeah, more. Can somebody donate some? Thank you. Please sign in. Now, this is a 40 foot building they're proposing. How high is this? 30? Somebody give me an estimate. Maybe one of the experts. I think it's 30. 10 feet higher than this. And how high are the units on top of the building going to be? Nobody's addressed that. It, Every commercial building has units on top of it. A little six foot berm is going to stop. You're going to be able to see something. And if, if, if there's food products that's going to be stored there, it's only going to bring rodents. And do they get a tax break for doing all this? 
if they move in. Now, that's about all I have to say. It's about, mainly it's about the water. Okay. If you can't handle it now, besides noise pollution, there is also something called water pollution. If that water is going to come into our basement, if it can't get, if it can't get to the Connecticut River now, how is that system going to get it there when they propose to, to dump that enormous amount of water in there? Okay, thank That's you very what much. I'm concerned about, and I don't know why they didn't address it. They do; they're experts. They they plan for the future. They have built multiple ones like this. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak against this application? I did say the gentleman with the white shirt. I, st I kept it on. <laughs> so, uh, good evening. Uh, actually, I'm here to uh, address concerns. My name is Brian Smith. I'm an attorney at Robinson and Cole in Hartford, Connecticut. I'm here on behalf of Carlos Pasta and uh, uh, I have uh, a letter which I'll read into the record. I hope it's, I can do it within three minutes. I may have some parenthetical. Uh, I have copies if you want for the commission or, yeah. So I'll start reading the letter while it's handed. Yeah, okay. So, dear Chairman Pesconos and Commission members, this letter is written on behalf of our clients, NFP Real Estate LLC, owner of 50 Talbot Lane, and the operating entity CP Foods LLC, DBA Carlos Pasta, uh, here and after collectively referred to as Carlos Pasta. As the adjoining neighbor west and southwest of the proposed development, Carlos Pasta has two concerns. First, that the pro proposal to construct a 359,640 square foot distribution facility that will generate a considerable amount of stormwater runoff from the roof and other impervious surfaces and could potentially cause or exacerbate drainage issues on the Carlos Pasta property. Second, Carlos Pasta is also concerned that the placement of all the loading docks on the westerly side of the proposed building could generate excessive amounts of air pollutants from trucks idling. Carlos Pasta has HVAC units that will take in these fumes and circulate within its food manufacturing facility. While we recognize that the Commission does not have jurisdiction over air pollution caused by truck exhaust, it does have jurisdiction over the location of the loading docks and signage. To the extent feasible, we ask that the loading docks be located so as not to cause Carlos Pasta to be unduly exposed to the truck exhaust that may be generated by the proposed use of 25 Talbot Lane. We also ask that the commission request that the applicant place signs on its property advising its truck drivers not to violate state and federal anti-idling mandates. The state of Connecticut DEEP has the model designed for such a sign and as shown below, um, Connecticut DEEP has a sample sign and it's also sold at its deep store. And you can see the, the sign example that I, I provided. We suggest that these signs be located at each loading dock and wherever trucks may idle on site. Uh, we understand that, also understand that the retention basin is planned and should accommodate the anticipated runoff. But Carlos Pasta respectfully requests that the commission and the town engineer carefully scrutinize the stormwater management system. Please ensure that plans for its maintenance are robust and adequate to prevent any adverse impacts to Carlos Pasta facility and its parking lots and do not inappropriately disturb the Newbury Brook or on-site wetlands. If you determine that what has been proposed is inadequate, we request that the commission revise the scope of the project so it will comply with your requirements. Uh, in our review, review of the stormwater management report 25 Talbot Lane, 5 and 25 Talbot Lane, and 475 and 50, 551 Governors Highway South Windsor, Connecticut, prepared by design professionals, dated July 2nd, 2021, and revised October 15th, 2021, we know that on page four therein, the applicant's proposed water quality basin shall be evaluated at least every five years for buildup of organic matter. In addition to the private requirements that we have by virtue of drainage easements, we request that these evaluations of the proposed water quality basin be done every three years instead of every five years due to the increasing number and intensity of 
of storm events. Thank you for your consideration of Carlos Pasta's concerns and requests, and I signed it, uh, Brian R. Smith. Uh, I have one additional comment, uh, which is that uh, actually in, in, in support, surprisingly, of the comments from the last gentleman who was up here also wearing a white shirt, uh, that uh, Carlos Pasta has in storm events uh, consistently since, and we have documents from August, there is ponding now when there's a rain event right now on Carlos Pasta in the parking lots near the, uh, the cul-de-sac. So that, that, that's a concern now. So we want to make sure with great preci precision that the new drainage systems are actually going to be adequately designed and maintained so as we don't have an issue with the new development as well as uh, anything old. Happy to answer any questions you may have, and thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you very much. A gentleman with his hand up. <laughs> nope, the other one. Sorry. You'll be next, uh, sir, with the red shirt. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ryan Will. I live at 95 Belden Road here in town. I'm in a direct area of this uh, proposed development. I want to start by genuinely thanking every single member of this committee for serving not only us, but our town and our, uh, our community as well. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I'd like to just, I'll try to keep it brief under three minutes. I just want to start by just giving a quote by William H. Stewart, the former U.S. Surgeon General, saying, Calling noise a nuisance is like calling smog an inconvenience. Noise must be considered a hazard to the health of people everywhere. So what does noise do to our health? And this is uh, a study done by the uh, Environmental Trolley Commission. Um, exposure to noise has been demonstrated to cause a rise in blood pressure. There's a correlation between noise exposure and adverse cardiovascular effects. Noise has been linked to gastrointestinal changes and increase of uh, need of antacids. Antacids, hypnotics, and sedatives. Noise has been shown to affect mental health. Um, intermittent noise, even at low levels, has been shown to make people tense and angry. Noise exposure has been linked to increased aggression and even violence and suicide. Intermittent and impulsive noise is responsible for sleep disturbances. Chronic sleep disturbance is associated with additional adverse health effects. Persons uh, who sleep uh, continually disturbed by noise or more, more likely to perceive themselves as being in poor health. Um, so why is this important? We're talking about the, the semi-truck traffic uh, at this proposed site. A little background about myself. Um, about 14 years ago, right out of high school, I went to a tech school for a year and a half and became a certified technician uh, and a subject matter expert on semi-trucks. I worked on tractor trailers as an authorized freightliner mechanic for three years. I did get out of the industry due to uh, the impact on my body from the uh, oil, debris, exhaust, uh, weight, and just the overall close contact with the trucks. I now work in the public safety sector uh, as a town employee for a neighboring town. Um, however, with that, I just want to talk about the sound from the tractor trailers. The intensity or power um, of sound decibels, uh, roughly every 10 decibels, is doubled. So perception on the human body for an increase in 10 decibels is doubled. So it's a logarithmic scale when we uh, measure decibels and noise. So per multiple studies, the uh, noise exhibited from tractor trailers is measured to be between 80 I've decibels. So just as an example, one heavy truck produces the noise equivalent of over 32 automobiles, over 32 automobiles for one semi-truck. The noise levels generated by a diesel uh, tractor pulling away from a stop may exceed 90 decibels, um, the threshold for hearing loss. And this is all measured at 50 feet, which is the front doorstep of many residents along uh, Governor's Highway and Belden as well. Um, and then the, the sound or power of noise from a diesel or heavy truck uh, is on the order of some uh, 300 times greater than the ambient street noise produced. I have a second study and publishment from the Illinois Department of Transportation on how trucks affect traffic noise. Um, and this one shows that uh, one truck at 55 miles an hour is as loud as 50 cars traveling at the same speed. Um, and again, just 
uh, as an example, again, decibels is a logarithmic scale. So 60 decibels is twice as loud as 50 decibels. And hearing these tractor trailers in our neighborhood at 80 to 90 decibels is absolutely um, poor for our health and our mental well-being. Um, so again, uh, a diesel truck at 50 feet has the same decibel reading as a freight train at 100 feet, as measured by the uh, Illinois Department of Transportation. Uh, again, I'm trying to make this as quick as possible. Uh, a study from the National Academics you have of much Science. More. Uh, just two more points, if that's okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, um, and I'm just trying to give you the bullet points too. Um, a study from the National Academics of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, their Transportation Research Bo Board. Um, again, noise from heavy-duty diesel tractor trailers from 50 feet um, had an average sound of 78 decibels just from the uh, engine. Uh, 85 decibels at the exhaust, uh, the engine cool, uh, the engine fan cooling uh, motor uh, at 82 decibels and a minimum of five truck tires at 75 decibels at 35 miles an hour, which is a little bit higher than the speed on Governor's Highway. If you actually add all these um, readings together, it compounds and creates a, a noise measurement at 50 feet. A tractor trailer traveling at 35 miles an hour uh, outputs 96 decibels, which is six decibels above uh, dangerous hearing loss, uh, as noted by OSHA. And the last thing I would like to add, again, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to take up a whole lot of time here, um, is from the Jacobs Vehicle System. If you're not familiar with the Jacobs Vehicle System, they produce the Jake brake on um, semi-truck diesel engines. Um, this is a, their study and article labeled uh, Vehicle Noise Levels and Compression Release Engine Braking. Uh, actually, the Jake Brake uh, Engineering Company in this article is produced right out of Bloomfield, two towns away, um, which is where the study was produced. But they have noted um, in their own study that during acceleration, tractor trailers emit approximately 96 on average decibels of noise, 80 decibels of noise at uh, idle, and their Jacobs brake, uh, engine braking system emits 101 decibels of noise, which again is 21 decibel, uh, decibels over the recommended noise. Last thing I want to add is uh, one thing I had to do as a DOT inspector back when I was working on tractor trailers was inspect um, backup alarms. They had to be working condition per DOT standard. Um, Echo, ECCO is the main uh, manufacturer and that's what all the major truck brands come with right out of the factory. Their backup alarm is a, a, it's a variance alarm so it starts low and works high as it gets higher on the sound spectrum. That alarm straight out of the factory coming on uh, uh, semi trucks is between 82 to 102 decibels when it's backing up. Um, I would just like to add that all these noises compounded are, are detrimental, they're dangerous to our, our mental health, our physiologic health, and our well-being. You're gonna see the quality of life of, of your, your fellow neighbors um, greatly decrease, and, and it's gonna be a very, very poor lifestyle for us. Again, I'd like to very much thank you for your time, um, and uh, thank you for taking this into consideration. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, could you ask the speaker to leave those reports with us? Oh, um, is it possible for you to leave those reports? I have copies of everything. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you again. And you signed in already? I did, yes, okay, thank you, thank sir. You. Thank you. Am I audible? Hi, this is Priyank Singhvi. I am from 121 Edgewood Drive. We just moved in like six months back to our house. This is our first house. A couple of questions I have for applicant. Earlier tonight, applicant was defending that uh, similar size of warehouses where we have like 50 plus uh, docking station, like Mobis, Home Depot, Hyundai, uh, we, the town has approved. But the applicant, I think, failed to mention none of them has houses near those distribution center. None of them ha have houses all three sides of the distribution center. None of them have like 100 houses near them. So that is one question. So if town is looking for approving it, I think that needs to be considered. Second is that if a town is looking for the 500K uh, revenue uh, from the taxes of this property, why can't town use the abandoned warehouse on US-5, civilian Avenue, which have been vacant for a few years? Uh, they can be repurposed, they're already zoned. 
so that is one question I had. Uh, the next question is that, uh, uh, like, uh, my my child here is a transformer fan, so he was very excited when he heard about the new warehouse and he'll be getting to see all the trucks. But then I showed him this video, how much noise a single transformer will make from 50 feet. Our house is like 400 feet from the nearest docking station. Sorry, just YouTube ads. This is just one trailer loading station from 50 feet away. And I think there will be more than 50 or 54, approximately 24 7, seven days a week, 24 hours, 12 months. Uh, other thing which we had for the application, uh, applicant is that the trees and the six feet trees, which they are tra uh, telling that it will block the views. What about fall and winters? There are no leaves on the trees how it will block the view from the near houses. I'm, I'm like not sure how it will happen. And also a tree takes almost like 20 years to mature. So what will happen from day one when the trees are installed till the 20 years? We'll, we'll see those uh, 40 feet building. Uh, that's all I had. Thank you. Okay, thank you. A gentleman with a lightish green shirt. It was po yeah. Um, yes, you. Okay. He was raising his hand for me. Um, Jill, oh, okay. Marino, Jill Marino, 97 Edgewood. Could you repeat this address? 97 Thank Edgewood. You. And I'm actually going to read from my phone so that I stay in my three minutes. Um, I represent myself, my husband, my son. We live two doors down from Gary Crenshaw, who submitted a letter earlier today. I would like to just jump on with everything he said I agree with. Um, the other thing is the negative impact of the noise. When I go outside, I could hear Carlos Pasta, no problem at all. I could hear their intercoms. I could hear trucks going in and out. Um, the impact of the amount of tractor trailers that will be on this new site will make that 100 times worse. The other thing is I can see the lights from Carlos Pasta now. Never mind the extra lights they're going to put in. And on the 35 foot, I guess, request they're asking for a permit on that. So that's all I wanted to add is the noise, the lights, and duplicate Gary's insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. The tall gentleman in back. Oh, okay. You're all set. Uh, <laughs> uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak against? tried to cut my uh, speech down to three minutes. It was five. So I'll do my best. My name is Sharon Stimson. I live at 55 Cody Circle. My husband and I have lived there for over 22 years. Our property is within the 500 foot abutter line of this proposed development. This industrial zone property is surrounded by three residential areas, as you know by now. So my question is, why is this zoned industrial? From what I've heard, these, these four pieces of land were zoned industrial a long time ago, like 1979 or prior. I did not know this when we moved into our house in 1999, but either way, even if we did know, it never would have crossed my mind that something so massive would be built so close by. It just doesn't make sense to me. One of my biggest questions is how can this industrial warehouse be allowed to operate 24 hours a day? According to the applicant's team, there is nothing we can do about that. How is that even possible? And again, I know a lot of people have talked about the noise, but I'm going to talk about it too. The noise from the trucks coming in and out 24 hours a day. 
to when we sleep at night and it's cool outside, enough to leave our windows open, will we now hear trucks pulling in and out and the beeping noise they make backing up all hours of the night? Even if we are 200, 300, 500 feet away, won't we still hear these trucks? Many times of the last two summers late at night, I can hear music coming from outside. Since it's late at night, I decided to call the South Windsor Police Department. They told me that they had received other complaints. After the noisy music still did not stop, I called them again and was told that they were actually unable to find the source. They told me that the music that I was hearing was coming from across the Connecticut River several miles away in the town of Windsor. Now, if sound travels that far, how is it going to be when this business opens up in our neighborhood? And what about the exhaust from all the trucks? With such a high volume of trucks in and out operating 24 hours a day, won't, affect, won't that affect the air quality for all the residences surrounding this property? And then our property values. Would you want to live near this? What about our quality of life? At what cost to the residents? Are we all supposed to suffer the consequences of this industrial zoned area from over 40 years ago with increased noise pollution and increased air pollution just so the town can reduce their mill rate? That is a high price to pay. If that is the case, then this is not the town that I used to love. If that is the case, this is not the same town that I raised my family in. So I ask you, would you want to live next to this yourselves? There has got to be a better solution for this property. How about a soccer field or a school or an office building or a park or just leave it as it is? I will say this again. There has got to be a better solution for this property. I am 110% against this warehouse. This potential development has caused me so much emotional distress and anxiety. It has even unfortunately brought tears to my eyes. Therefore, I strongly urge you to vote against this proposal. Thank you for your time. Please, order. Order. I. I can clear the room for outbursts. Please keep order, okay? Is there anyone else who would like to speak against the gentleman with his phone up? Hi, good evening. Um, yeah, before I just start, I just want to put a point here. Uh, when Peter and the applicant was talking this... Uh, if you could introduce yourself. Oh, sorry. Uh, I'm Naga. I'm just staying in 116 Edgewood Drive. Um, so even today evening and uh, the previous meeting, when Peter was uh, talking about this uh, proposal, he clearly says that um, as requested, we just changed the model. We just moved from east to west. None of the uh, public from our side, we never saved, we never requested him to change anything. From day one, we are saying we don't want this warehouse. I want to be very clear in this. We don't want this warehouse in our neighborhood. To continue with that point, <laughs> the wetland, what we are having today, that is a clear barrier to show where the industries are, between the industries and the residents where, what, where we are living today. If, if my backyard comes with this big wetland, sorry, big uh, warehouse, when I wake up in the morning, I need to see this backyard, see my backyard with the industry. It is going to be very disturbing for me. And when I bought the house, I just bought it with a lot of memories behind it. I cannot leave my house or I cannot leave my ch kids outside like this. And the other point is, everyone talked about the uh, noise pollution. We need to think about the air pollution too. If 
one truck produces uh, exhaust and lim minimum amount of uh, smoke. Think about 500 plus trucks comes in a day. Think of, we are just already decided if we approve this, we decided to remove all the trees. Where all those smokes will go? It is going to fall on our house. And other point we need to think about is the building. The Most of the houses, what we are having today, built it in 60s, 60s and 70s. All are like, it's not 60 years old buildings. If during the construction and after the construction, our building is going to get damaged. And even whenever they are going to download or download the uh, trucks, it, the health of the building is going to get disturbed. And it's not only the health of the building and even the individual's health will also get impacted. I am, I am right behind this building. It is going to really disturb me a lot. Other point what I want to talk about is the lights. Um, he was talking about, uh, he, he was requesting for 25, 35 feet lights. My bedroom, to be honest, my bedroom, the person who designed this house, they kept it in the backyard thinking that I should not hear any noise from my front of my home in the road. And I should not see any lights during uh, any cars coming on the way so that that will disturb my sleep. If 35 feet tall lights are going to be coming behind my home and if it is going to right, uh, right put it on my face during the, throughout the night, think about how we can sleep, how long I can wake up and how long I can keep my doors closed. It is not, a, it's not at all possible. Just think it from the individual perspective. Please think from our shoes and see how, how difficult this is going to be. None of the applicants here will never agree to bring this big warehouse in their backyards. And, but they are ready to disturb the place where we are living peacefully. That's it from my end. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak against? Gentleman with the red hoodie. Oh, red socks hoodie. I'll sign in first. Name is Lee Lovering, 20 Elizabeth Street. And the subject I wanted to talk about tonight or bring up, and I don't think this has been addressed, but I could be wrong. We're talking about groundwater, groundwater being taken from the land out of the Connecticut River. I think as you all know, <clears throat> the whole parcel which runs <clears throat> from Pleasant Valley to Governor's Highway at one time was all agricultural. The primary crop that was grown there was potatoes, <clears throat> and they'd rotate crops periodically with corn. Well, <clears throat> they used chemicals to kill insects to protect the crops. And <clears throat> back in 1964, there was a young boy, five years old, who lived on Edgewood. And he and two of his buddies decided they would go out into the fields and play. <clears throat> and this actually was on the land that is currently Cody Circle. Well, the three boys went out and they decided they were gonna pretend they were camping out. And they sat around and they found this old can and there was a hole punched in it like we used to use the old church keys, okay, to open a beer. And there was still some liquid in it. <clears throat> and one of the boys thought he'd be smart, and he drank out of the can, and he died. The can was labeled arsenic. Talked to a good friend of mine here in town whose family was in farming for many years. I asked him about that. <clears throat> And he said, well, he said, arsenic was probably used back in the 30s and 40s. It then was stopped probably in the late 40s, early 50s. Then, about 15 years ago, <clears throat> a neighbor of mine across the street on Elizabeth Street decided he was going to drill in the backyard for a small, make a small or shallow well for the purpose of bringing water up because of the uh, water table and the aquifers. 
just water his lawn. He contracted somebody to come out and drill. And before they put a well in, they wanted to test the water. The test came back and they said, no way. This water is so contaminated, if it was sprayed, if you wanted your lawn, it would be very dangerous as far as affecting pets and children. <clears throat> My point is, I don't know if there's been any type of water testing for this kind of pollution, because with all this soil that's going to be dug up and all the digging that's going to go on, it's definitely going to upset <clears throat> the water level and everything there. And if you start having polluted water carried from that site, and it goes into the Connecticut River, the state of Connecticut is not going to be very happy. That's all I got. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak against? Gentleman with his hand up. I'll sign in properly this time. Okay. I'll be brief. Um, I just wanted to discuss some of the tax benefits that were talked about here. I've heard between the economic development meeting, 500. Please re reintroduce yourself. John Hapkowitz, 44 Cody Circle. Thank you, John. Um, speaking to the tax base benefits for this application, um, I went on the town website um, and looked at the pavement management plan. I've got several copies here. Familiar with that. Uh, many of the roadways, this is December of 2019. I know there's been some repairs done. I just want to speak to these roads not being designed to take this traffic and the impact that's going to have on the cost of the town of South Windsor to repair these roads more frequently than we do now. We're talking trucks. We get random trucks. We do get a lot of trucks once in a while. But when you're putting in a, a, a center like this, um, and I'm, I'm not sure if that's the latest, but that's straight from the website on the, the condition of the existing governor's highway, especially towards Route 5. I know repairs have been done recently, but they're not in great condition right now. And I can't imagine what they're going to be in a couple of years with this, the trucks beating on them, the impact over the rail and then everything else. It just, it'll add up. And I just wanted to get that out there. That's, there's not just a, a tax benefit for the, for the application. There's going to be tax costs for us to maintain our town roads. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak against or have questions or concerns? Please step forward. Hi, my name is John Dringa. I live on 144 Edgewood Drive. Um, first, I'd like, you, I'd like to thank you for your service um, and staying this late tonight. Um, so I understand that the loading docks were moved from the Cody Circle side to the, to the development of uh, Carlos Pasta side. Um, and I believe that was done because they didn't want the loading docks facing the residential area. And that makes perfect sense because there's a lot of noise that comes from those loading docks. However, the major issue I have with this is now all of the loading docks are facing to the west, which means all the trucks that pull into those loading docks back up um, and pull out will be facing Edgewood Drive and Judy Lane, which means we will get all the volume for those diesel engines coming right down our street. Um, therefore, um, I don't think it should be allowed to have all those loading docks on that side of the building either if we can't put the loading docks on the Cody Circle side. The truth is that there's no way you can configure this distribution center where it's not going to 
pollute the area with noise because it has residential all around it and even Carlos Pasta doesn't want the loading docks facing them because of the emissions. Um, so I'd um, like to get to a different point. Someone at a prior meeting um, was in favor and they said that they couldn't think of, they thought that this was a good plan and they couldn't, they thought maybe the land could be used for a worse purpose if they didn't pass this plan. So I thought about that after the meeting, and I thought to myself, what could possibly be worse than this distribu distribution center running in our backyards 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Keep in mind that's Saturdays and Sundays. So while our neighbors are trying to have a major celebration, um, a life moment, maybe a, a graduation party or an 80th birthday party, they're gonna have nonstop noise from the distribution center. Huh? Um, what could be worse? You'd really have to think hard. Maybe like an international airport or a NASCAR racetrack, a high security prison. None of those are gonna go in this site, right? We're not gonna prove that. Huh? So I would venture to say that this is the worst possible purpose for this site. Hmm. Um, the, the builder even admitted himself that they couldn't sell this property as a warehouse unless it operated 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Hmm. I don't think that's fair. I, th I think we at least should have Sunday. I mean, even God rested on the seventh day. I think we deserve one day a week where there's peace and quiet. Hmm. Um, from there, I'd like to just transition into um, the taxes. Um, I was actually a, I have an accounting degree, but. Um, John, do you have much more? Uh, just a little bit more. Okay. So um, just a couple of things. I just wanted to say that, you know, I think we all want lower taxes. However, it should be up to the people who live in this community, raise their children, and will probably die in this community, whether they're willing to pay more taxes or not. It shouldn't be up to the builder. <laughs> Um, I think that all of us in this room tonight would say that we would gladly pay a little bit more taxes than to have this distribution center in our backyard. Because lowering the tax rate shouldn't come at the cost of the quality of life. And then the last thing I just want to point to, I'm not going to go into details about it, but um, there was recently an article in the Washington Post. Um, it's called, it was uh, published on October 11th, 2021. Um, and the title is Warehouse Jobs Recently Thought as Jobs of the Future, Suddenly Jobs Few Workers Want. And it goes into detail about how Amazon, Walmart can't fill those positions because people, they can't get enough people to work those kind of jobs. I worked in a warehouse, it's dirty, dusty, and it's very physical. And A, there's just not enough people that want to do it, and B, there's not enough people who can do it. And I think we already have a lot of warehouses in this area, and I just think we're gonna oversaturate the market if we build another one of this magnitude. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to speak tonight? Hello, my name is Janet Holozak. I reside at 39 Cody Circle. My husband and I have raised two children in this town. We moved here back in 1993. We built our home, and we are the first owners and intended to stay here for a long time. I have contributed to this community as a Cub Scout leader, a soccer coach. I've been employed by the South Windsor Board of Education as a substitute teacher, a reading paraprofessional, and I have volunteered as an art docent and several other extracurricular activities. We love this town and we're very happy with the education my children received. This application is extremely anxiety provoking for me. I will share a personal story. I have 
been diagnosed with hyperacusis. And for those of you who do not know what that is, it's a disorder with a sensitivity to sound, especially loud sound. I currently live and sleep in a room that has noise cancellation devices. If this application is approved, I will have to move. That's all I've got, because you've heard everything else. Thank you. Thank you very much. The gentleman in the back. Good evening, commissioners. Uh, my name is Richard DeLay. I live at 95 Cody Circle. I'm a direct to butter and I've been there for about nine years. <clears throat> and I just, I just want to clarify, this is going to be continued, so we're going to have another opportunity to speak at the next meeting, correct? Yes, but because uh, have... at that time I'll ask people to only uh, discuss new issues. A absolutely. New I, just, I have a lot of stuff that I I don't want to kill everybody, so. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, first, uh, kind of question. Per the uh, town zoning regulation, the applicant is required to include uh, the individual locations of trees larger than 18 inches in diameter in the site plan contents. Uh, I have not seen those posted on the website. I mean, I look forward to, to seeing them. Is Oh, have they been submitted? Are they there, or is it just not posted? I don't know. It's something I'd love to get clarified. Um, <clears throat> another point is the uh, stamped site plan for the uh, combined 25 Talbot Lane property lists a front yard uh, with regulated setbacks on two sides, um, east with Talbot Lane and north with Governor's Highway and the remaining property lines are displayed as side yards um, with the entire combined property. So um, there is no rear yards on the, uh, on the property design. So um, like, there's different setbacks for a rear yard than side yards. I don't know how they had the opportunity to just make everything a side yard. Right now the property has uh, the same number of rear yards as uh, members of the public that chose to speak on behalf of the, the project, which is none. Um, the, the proposed development property borders a residential community with many children, some with autism, and uh, directly abuts two open space lots uh, used by children for passive recreation. Um, any development, regardless of the size, uh, should have the entire property uh, or at least the detention pond fenced uh, to prevent the drowning hazard and accident. A, a six foot berm doesn't stop uh, wandering children. Um, and they moved into a neighborhood that didn't have a pond or, or an exposed uh, body of water like that. So there, there is a concern there. So um, the current proposal for uh, constructing a Titanic 360,000 square foot warehouse uh, acres of pavement and scores of tractor trailers running 24 seven is the harshest use of the property imaginable. Uh, and I use the term Titanic deliberately because the building is approximately the length of the Titanic uh, and five times the width. So imagine uh, five of those ships docked a few hundred yards behind your house forever. All right? It is the harshest use of the property possible and it changes the character of the town. Uh, a structure this size, along with its fleet of tractor trailers wedged uh, between residential areas, is a visual assault on the neighborhood. Uh, the 50-foot uh, buffer on either side of the property, uh, property line of sparse deciduous trees, um, which have been ravaged by the invasive oriental bittersweet. So whatever the expectation of uh, screening uh, this, 100 feet total would do, has been destroyed by uh, the bittersweet invasive species. Um, and 
it will create nothing but an unobstructed view of the mega warehouse uh, while bare for five months of the year. Um, it's common sense that the proposed planting of five foot trees spaced out along a six foot berm relative to an 800 foot long, 40 foot tall structure is not nearly enough to conceal the activity or visually obscure the structure. Uh, the, the same concealing practices once used for smaller buildings cannot just be adopted for these new mega structures. And I, I think the uh, regulations need to reflect that and be updated. Um, the, the constant noise pollution caused by such a massive 24 seven operation could destroy quality of life. Those who have worked at or near such extreme trucking facilities understand the continuous roaring of diesel engines and various accompanying clamor that will be heard 24 hours a day, seven days a week, morning, noon, and night. Um, and as discussed, these trucks aren't uh, regulated by the NORS ordinances. Um, and almost more importantly, are, and discussed earlier, are neither is the backup alarms, which are required by OSHA when backing up without a ground guide. Uh, these alarms are piercing as they are specifically designed to be even louder than the, the uh, multitude of running diesel engines. Um, it, it, they're designed to be even louder. So, um, the traffic, safety, flooding, and pollution are also a, a few other unacceptable consequences of a proposal like this. However, I will leave that to others to uh, kind of dismantle that potential tragedy. Um, the proposed 25 Talbot Lane construction will be the single severest incursion into a residential area of a mega warehouse in the history of Connecticut. There are no appropriate comparable examples to this. Um, <clears throat> do you have uh, development and destruction more? to quality of life? Richard, do you have much more? Uh, not that much more. Okay, but, thank you. So the Aldi's distribution center is so relatively wild it shouldn't even be brought up. Even Windsor's Folly, which is held up as an example of warehouse development gone awry, is a mere fraction of the direct 500 footer and 1,000 foot of abutters of what's being proposed here. I will repeat because it is noteworthy. This will be the single severest incursion into residential area of a mega warehouse in the history of Connecticut. 169 towns in Connecticut, 169 planning and zoning committees. No one has ever allowed things to go this far. Uh, this site has residential zoning on three sides. Uh, I'm sure other zoning boards have felt the lure of theoretical revenue for their town, but always embraced thank you, their values and found the destructive noise, traffic, safety, and pollution, visual assault, and changing character of the town to be too harsh. I said, this isn't just our legacy. This would be your legacy. <clears throat> Uh, I also want to remind everyone that only eight months ago, South Windsor um, proposed to build a $3.9 million football field and purchase a second town hall. Um, so it would be disingenuous for anyone to imply financial hardship or forward the idea that we might have to raise taxes if we don't develop a plot of land which has sat undeveloped since the town was founded. <clears throat> um, I, I'm going to. I'm going to stop there, and I thank you for your time. Uh, I am going to, I, I think one thing that needs to be pointed out is even in opposition, it's being socialized that we're going to get $550,000 a year eventually in, in taxes, and the figure is nothing close to that, that that calculation is really only two-thirds of the equation. At no point is the, the, the negative effects and the loss in property value and loss of taxes. I'll get into it. To Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak tonight against questions or concerns? I, I think I can condense this to uh, two and a half minutes, if I may. OK. Uh, please okay. John, reintroduce John, John yourself. John Holizak, for the record, Cody Circle. Thank you. Um, the first part of this is okay, it's a distribution warehouse, but they're not telling you much about it. I want you to look inside yourselves and say, how would you feel if it turned out to be a chemical distribution warehouse? How would you feel if it was a flammables distribution warehouse? 
I submit for the record, uh, this is uh, August 2019, Lex 18 TV uh, out in Kentucky. Uh, for the record, I'm just going to read the title. I'm sure you guys will scan it. Um, Fume spur evacuation of Amazon facility in Lexington. Six treated. 500 people evacuated. And for the record, the Los Angeles Times, um, June 2020, the title here is uh, Massive Fire at Redlands Warehouse, okay? Um, this is a, uh, a facility that contracts with Amazon. So let me just read the full title. Massive Fire at Redlands Warehouse burns Amazon trailers and briefly closes Route 10 freeway. I submit these for the record. Now, to change subjects, you've heard a lot about external noise, okay? I've been looking for a internal building noise expert. Experts are very hard to find to testify on the part of oppositionalists. I've spent hundreds of hours in, in these matters here before you trying to get people to testify. Their bread and butter is the developers. They don't like to go against them unless they're almost retired or whatever, but I'm not going to belabor it. The subject here is internal noise from the structure. And uh, I'm going to read, I'm not going to read a bunch here, okay? But uh, June 14th, 2021, um, this is the Hartford Business Journal. Hartford's distribution real estate market is red hot. Get a peek inside, inside a modern logistics warehouse. And I'm just going to read a couple of underlined sentences here. You're welcome to read this if you're on education. Uh, Vertex Corporation's 460,000 square foot Bacon Road Distribution Center in Enfield. Forklifts beep as they whip around the floor, bringing pallets of products to storage shelves that reach toward the top of the building. The cacophony of spanner, scanner beeps, forklift horns, and machinery whirring play over a background of classic rock radio 24 hours a day. Vertex uses the massive facility to sell its printing, packaging, and other products to businesses. And then another sentence down here. During the final three months of 2020 alone, for example, Amazon signed new leases for 400,000 square feet in Cromwell and 185,000 square feet in Wallingford. So you can read this. And to get back to the subject of, uh, of internal noise, I remind the commissioners that this structure that's proposed before you is a sheet metal building, okay? It's gonna reverberate like a drum at least a concrete construction building with concrete walls, not concrete facades on the first story like the uh, architectural consultant described, but an actual concrete construction building would actually be able to concentrate this internal noise into the building itself, okay? Now, very briefly, uh, feasibility of warehouse drone adoption and implementation and drones are not something that uh, you guys have really tried to regulate here, but it's coming to other towns. And again, I'm not gonna read this for the record. You guys are smart. I listed the page numbers you should look at. Um, just real briefly, one sentence from the abstract. While aerial delivery drones capture headlines, the pace of adoption of drones in warehouses has shown the greatest acceleration. Uh, from the introduction, unmanned drones have been described on the verge of blowing a big hole in the supply chain. An assertion supported by a predicted global market of 22 billion by 2022 and compounded annual growth, yada, 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 statistics. Okay, and I'm just gonna read one sentence from page 10 and one sentence from page 13. And that should wrap it up for internal noise from the structure and why I asked for a concrete building, not a sheet metal reverberating drum. Okay, page 10, I underlined it for you. Unmanned warehouse drones may greatly improve warehouse operations. As previously noted, warehouse drones may be aerial. For difficult to reach places, unmanned aerial warehouse drones facilitate inventory management using barcodes, etc. And I'm just going to read a sentence off of page 13. Bear with me. The interest in warehouse drones by companies like Walmart and Amazon focuses on leveraging drone strengths primarily to maintain inventory accuracy and shorten response times for picking and response to consumer orders. These drones are very, very loud, 
if, if you've ever been near one, you know what they sound like. We're not going to bring a recording and play it for you. Um, you. Guys have been at this for a long time. I appreciate your volunteer effort to the town, and I think I kept that to three minutes. Thank you. Okay. I do hope to comment on other issues with this application. So, Caitlin, uh, can we get that light off? Well, we're. I think we're just about done for tonight. Um, unless there's anyone else who would like to speak before we leave. <laughs> okay. Um, then what I'll do is ask uh, for our next meeting uh, if we could just keep it to uh, topics we haven't discussed before and uh, new information. Um, Michelle, did you have? Uh, no, I'm all set. Oh, when would be our next meeting? Do we have? Uh, the next regularly scheduled meeting would be November 9th. And we have possibly other business then too, right? I mean, well, you have several public hearings backed up, yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I wasn't sure how much more public comment beyond what we heard tonight that the public had ready to prepare. If there was a lot more or not, maybe it would help for determining next meeting. Okay. Because uh, several people referenced they were going to talk at the next meeting. I wasn't sure why they didn't bring up their topics tonight. Right, okay. So um, I'm, I'm guessing there are some other people that want to talk at our next public hearing. Uh, okay, so like I said, new topics, new information only. Um, and uh, at this time, uh, I'll accept a motion to continue the public hearing to November 9th, 2021. We have Commissioner Flagg. Do we have a second? We have a motion and a second. I think, I think the commissioners would like at least to ask for some information to be provided to us uh, in addition to what we asked for the last time. Okay. Um, Steve, uh, you've got your microphone on. Uh, so I would like to know a little more officially whether we're dealing with a freight terminal or a distribution center. Um, maybe the best example, since, since there's no definition, uh, what are the, you know, 10 nearest or five nearest freight terminals and five nearest distribution centers so we can say the standard or the meaning of the term freight terminal is whatever, okay. Um, Your regulations do direct you to Webster's Dictionary when you don't have them defined. And there is a definition of freight terminal in Webster's that we can make sure we have available. Okay, well, that would be great if we bring that along. Um, I guess I'd like to ask that the traffic study um, provide more information about truck traffic and not just vehicles and the impact on the, and also information on the roads, damage to the roads potential. And I'd like the applicant to consider um, the adequacy of Talbot Lane. And there was a suggestion also that the um, road be designed to uh, only allow a left turn out of Talbot Lane. Um, and maybe I just gotta say, if this is a freight terminal, there's no way I would vote for it, okay? So it's very important that we make that decision. Uh, okay, thank you, Steve. Are there any other concerns commissioners would 
possibly like addressed? On the uh, traffic study, can we make sure that it does incorporate the school buses, seeing that the test that was done in June rather than in the height of the school year? And I, I think part of that is um, I, I have noticed them stopping at the uh, railroad crossings and they are mandated to open their doors and uh, the delay that might cause. Yeah, a couple of comments I have too. I just want to hear addressed is uh, what your plan is for truck traffic along Excuse the roads. Me. And, Thank you. Uh, the queuing of uh, tractor trailer trucks. Uh, I realize it's a short driveway. I've seen the comparison to other sites tonight. Uh, I realize that your parking lot holds a lot of vehicles. I want to see what the intent is with the use of tractor trailer trucks. Are they going to idle in the parking lot and wait to queue? Are they queuing on the road? Are they idling there? Or are they just sitting there parked for some period of time? I'd like to see what the plan of action is for that. Okay. Anything else, commissioners? I had one more. I'd also like the applicant to um, predict for us the noise levels from the uh, operation of the trucks from attaching and detaching the trailers um, and any other sources of noise um, since our uh, noise ordinance has an exclusion for this, but we as a board, I think, can look after the health of our community. So I'd like to know exactly just what the noise levels are predicted to be, how frequent the impulse noises will be, and how loud they will be. I do have one. Commissioner Dexter. Michelle. Did the town council vote for a tax abatement for this project? Uh, to my knowledge, it has not been in front of the town council. Okay. So then my, my comment would be, if there is no tax abatement, would this applicant move forward? I just have one more. Um, I realize that the tenant can't be named, and I'm not sure if you have one in mind or not, but I'm looking at this as more of a speculation um, design-wise. Uh, having a tenant may change or alter the design of the building uh, could actually make it smaller. It could actually uh, change the configuration of uh, truck bays and all that and where the garage doors are lined up. Uh, these are very important questions for us and certainly for the residents uh, surrounding this property. And I think that needs to be addressed. Okay, um, we got, Bill had his light on. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say uh, that um, this is an awful big thing that's coming our way. An awful lot of information has been passed to us tonight. And uh, there's a lot of pros and cons, a lot of questions and everything else. Uh, we get uh, truck terminals and different things coming in like that all the time. but. This one is a little different and it's bigger. And one thing I would like to see addressed is the pollution. You've got all the trucks are on one side and an awful lot of them are on one side. And uh, places like Carla's Pasta, uh, you know, they do have a concern about this pollution. And uh, if this is gonna be operational 24 hours a day, seven days a week with all of these different trucks coming in. Uh, that's a big concern. Um, but my main thing is that I hope this is really uh, looked at thoroughly uh, before a decision is made because, uh, like I said, it, it concerns an awful lot of people. Uh, it's a big project and there's pros and cons to it back and forth, and uh, it it deserves a lot of attention. And um, I, I know my uh, fellow commissioners will really look at this, and uh, I wish all you people out there good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Paul. Yeah, so this, this may feel like piling on, but I think all this testimony really helps us uh, ultimately make the right decision. So one of the issues that kind of struck me that came up was the issue with the soil. 
So I'm curious if there has been a soil study or if not, are there plans to do a soil study so we can determine if there is an issue there that was uh, addressed by one of the residents? Thanks, that's all I have. Commissioner Foley. Uh, I wanna make sure that the people on the downhill end of uh, this Newberry Brook, such as the Anderson family, that's the intersection of Main Street and Newberry Road, Three times this summer, Newberry Road has been closed down, down by Main Street by flooding. And I'm not talking about a little bit, like impassable. Town had to come out, put up the barricades. Um, I think those, those neighbors who are gonna be impacted by nine, nine acres of impervious surface need to be uh, contacted to know what's coming downhill. And if, if actually Newberry can continue to take this much uh, flow, I have, I've got some doubts on that. I've witnessed it this summer, and you can watch it tomorrow morning, too. So. Okay, anything else, commissioners? We have a motion on the table uh, to continue the public hearing. Uh, nothing else, call the question. All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Those opposed, motion passes. Thank you.